Double J, Jeff Jarrett here to tell you about SaveWithConrad.com. You've heard Conrad talk about the total nonstop savings they've provided current homeowners. But did you know Conrad and his team can also help my world listeners become homeowners? They make buying a home easier than getting the bag after a good housekeeping match. But don't take the last outlaw's word for it. Franklin Dove, Orlando, Florida. After listening to all of Conrad's podcasts and hearing the different stories that he shared, I felt the time was right for me to explore buying a home again and uh, reached out. And one thing led to another and finally closed last week. It was excellent. Uh, Everything flowed smoothly from my first contact. I just put in the initial request online. Francis reached out. We started the application process, got the approval moving. Holly was great. Larry Thompson was amazing. Everything was smooth. Communication was perfect. Really, it was a, a much better experience than anything that I could have imagined. My name is Franklin Dove in Orlando, Florida, and I got into my dream home thanks to SaveWithConrad.com. That's right. In my world, it doesn't get any better than five stars. Don't let your landlord get over on you. Walk out on that bad deal and stop throwing your money away on rent today with SaveWithConrad.com. That's right. It's SaveWithConrad.com. And MLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. Eric, what's going on, man? How are you? Just another day in paradise. A, a big day in paradise, but another day in paradise. Well, as uh, folks are listening to this, you are across the water, as my dad used to say, uh, enjoying all that Europe has to offer and uh, along with Mrs. B, but we are still here in the thick of things on 83 weeks. And today we've got a very special episode because man, there has been all this conversation over the years about shoulda, woulda, coulda with Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart, man, Bruce Pritchard and I got in a huge screaming match when we did our WrestleMania nine episode, like six years ago, talking about the rumor in innuendo that these guys were supposed to hook up at SummerSlam 93, but it didn't happen, but it did actually happen. But in WCW five years later on a nitro of all things, and we're going to be watching that episode today. Uh, I don't know what feedback you saw, but I got really good feedback from last week's show. People enjoyed our trip down memory lane, talking about your journey to become an executive producer and then becoming the EVP. And I think you ruffled a few feathers. All of the uh, news sites were uh, quoting you left and right about the, he said, she says with Foley and Ganya and flair. Oh my, uh, what was your experience last week? Did you have as much fun with that episode as I did? No, no, I didn't have any fun with it. <laughs> actually, actually. And, and I was angry at myself. You know, we got done doing that podcast and I was just in a foul mood, foul mood. And I, it doesn't happen that much anymore to me. I don't get angry with other people very easily anymore. I don't allow that to happen. But I do get kind of hot with myself and angry with myself and, and because I sometimes let my emotions get the better of me. And usually it's childish shit that somehow gets to me. That's the stuff that pisses me off. Look, the, you know, I'll, I'll be very honest about it. You know, the, the Foley comments, more than anything, it hurt me, my feelings. And not to sound like a, you know, a wimp, but it just did. I'm human. And it's like, it caught me off guard to be very honest with you. And then we follow up with the Ric Flair stuff, which I've heard we've dealt with, we've discussed, I've been answering questions about it for years, but for whatever reason, maybe it was just because I was coming off the Foley shit or comments. I shouldn't say that's, it was his opinion. It's welcome to it. But well, yeah, when you hit me with the Ric Flair thing about him getting me the job as executive producer and all that stuff, it just, I, I overreacted once again. Ric Flair has his reasons for thinking what Ric Flair thinks. And it's, some of it I understand. I disagree with it, but I understand it. Um, but I've got nothing but respect for Rick, And I still have a lot of affection for Rick. But for whatever reason, that piece of history, which is very, very, it's a sore spot with Rick. 
and he gets emotional. And I guess I do too. And I felt bad about that. But other than that, it was a great show. <laughs> well, I had a fun time uh, talking about your journey because there's so many similarities about, you know, the way things were and the way things maybe are now. And uh, what's that old phrase about those who don't learn from history? Yeah, you know the rest. So listen, man, we're going to watch something that I think is a pretty historic nitro. Of course it happened. I can't believe this is real about 25 years ago. This is uh, October 2nd is uh, when you're listening to this and way back when this was in September 28th. So just a few days ago would have been the 25th anniversary of this. Does it feel like 1998 was 25 years ago? It doesn't to me. No, and it's like every time, you know, we make these references and we we date or, or put, you know, something into context as it relates to when it happened. And I'm starting to hear these, you know, 25 years ago. Well, you know, I'm, I'm getting to the point now where I want to talk to you, you know, when we're offline about making some rules for our shows going forward. One of which is we're never going to bring up the Ric Flair comments about getting me the job as executive producer. <laughs> and the other might be, let's just not put dates on things anymore. Cause it just makes me feel older than I already am. <laughs> it's like a quarter of a century ago, this happened. Was like, oh my God, really? It seems like about a month ago to me, but yeah, it was 25 years ago, man. It's crazy how time flies. You know, and I know I, people online have had a lot of fun with me talking about time and my obsession with time, but it's crazy to think that 1973 is as close to 1998 as we are now in 2023 to 1998. Like that feels like that can't yeah, be right. Yeah, yeah. That just adds insult to injury because I graduated from high school in 1973. So it's just, you know, it's like a, a, a mind fuck orgy every time I do one of these things. My goodness. Well, listen, let's, uh, let's roll that beautiful bean footage. We're going to be watching a very special nitro from September 28th, 1998 fire up your peacock. It's season four, episode 39. So when you go to peacock, you go to season four of nitro episode 39. And, uh, Eric, I don't know that you re realize this now, but <laughs> I can't believe this is real. We, at this point have had more episodes of 83 weeks than there have been episodes of nitro. <laughs> Nitro had 288 episodes. We are officially on episode 290, Eric. Wow. How about that? Well, I, I'm having more fun doing this. So, <laughs> 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 all right, folks, let's do it. Get Peacock ready. Season four, episode 39. We're watching Nitro together from September 28th, 1998. Here we go in three, two, one, play. Look at the audio. I love the open of Nitro, just that theme song, the pyro, the way the camera flies in. Eric, I would rather the show start with that than that video package. What say you? Yeah, as we've talked about recently, um, show opens, I tended to like to mix them up just a little bit. You know, this was a big match. We anticipated this to be a, a successful pairing, obviously, or we wouldn't have done it. 
And I really wanted to drive it home. I wanted that to be the focus. And I was telling the audience what to pay attention to. And actually, the, the, the setup and the way that package was edited, it really, really wasn't that bad. And in looking at this, as I've often said here, I go back and I watch these things with you. And it's like, this is the first time I've seen it. I didn't go back and watch the show once it was over. I, I mean, this is the first time I've seen it. And I do like the idea, the, the conceit of OWN against the NWO, the One Warrior Nation, was kind of a cool little gimmick. And it, it at least on the surface, had a lot of potential. Listen, I really liked the, uh, the shot, like it was almost like the bat signal, if you will, of his logo. I mean, that was cool. And of course the OWN is playing off of the NWO. Was that, was that a Jim Hellwig idea or did somebody else come up with the, no, I really do think Jim, Jim came up with that idea. It was, you know, when, when I hired Jim actually, while we were negotiating before it was official. I had flown to Phoenix to, to meet with Jim for the very first time and, and, and it really enjoyed the meeting. Uh, he's a very interesting cat. You know, he's diff- very, he was very, very different, but I found him to be somewhat fascinating, but I got home from Phoenix at the time I lived in Atlanta and I had a fax machine. Remember those had a fax machine in, in my home office. And by the time I got home, there was like 60 or 80 pages of ideas and notes, all handwritten, by the way. And I went through it and I thought, oh my gosh, what am I getting myself into? But Jim was, say whatever, people can say whatever they want to say about him. He was eccentric. He, he, he was a handful to manage in many respects, but he was a very creative guy. And you may have heard me say in the past, I'd rather have a fast horse that needs to be slowed down than a slow yeah. horse that'll never speed up. Mm-hmm. And Jim was a very, very, very fast horse when it came to creative. A lot of it was just outlandish and not usable, but there were there were nuggets of some pretty good stuff in there. And I think this was one of them. We've covered Fall Brawl 98 in the archives and also the Epic Nitro two weeks prior to this, where Ric Flair came back to WCW after all the lawsuits and the legal battles. And that Flair episode was the end of a three week win streak where Nitro would defeat Raw. And it's the last time Nitro would win consecutive weeks in the war. That's pretty crazy to think about that that was it in 1998. A taped Raw would then defeat Nitro the following week. Um, I know you've always really believed that, that live, live, live is important. Do you think that's changed over time? I mean, does it matter? Did it matter as much in 98? Does it matter more now being live versus taped? Well, I I think it definitely matters more now. Um, I I think it's always mattered, but clearly the, the, just look at the values of WWE content because it's live. It's not sports, but it's as close to sports as you're going to get on television because sports are generally alive. And so is professional wrestling. And I think that move to the live format consistently weekly because WWE had done raw. They'd have one live show, one tape show, one live show, one tape show. So it wasn't like we were the first nitro was the first, you know, live show. We were just the first live show 52 weeks a year and changing that, that paradigm. And making that standard operating procedure is one of the reasons why the values for AEW and the values for WWE today are what they are. Had it not been for Nitro going live every week and then WWE in order to compete going live every week until it became the standard, that's what you do if you do professional wrestling and you want to be successful at it, um, is one of the reasons why professional wrestling content today is worth what it's worth. But even back then, 25 years ago, a quarter of a century ago, live still had an urgency to it that a tape show just didn't have. And it's hard to explain. I think some of it is subconscious in the minds of the viewer. They're there. They're watching as as it's really happening. It's not that the show is necessarily any better creatively or in terms of the talent performance, but the connection that you're making to the audience, however conscious or subconscious that may be when it's live matters. And I believed it 
back in 95 when we launched Nitro, which is why I wanted to do it live every week, even though it was more expensive. It was a bigger investment to go live every week. It would have been cheaper to do what WWE was doing and go live tape or even just tape the shows. But I wanted it to have that energy, conscious or otherwise, subconscious, of being a live show. It, it, it reinforced the message I was trying to send to the audience, which was you have to be there. You, you don't want to watch it after the fact. You want to be a part of the event as it's happening. And it, it clearly worked. We got Hulk Hogan in the middle of the ring with you being a stick man. Let's track Hogan here for a minute or so. Zeros. I took your stars, all the ones that you like to say are the good guys, all the way from the top, and I made them think they were great. I made them think that they had a chance in the ring against Hollywood because Hollywood is all about the almighty dollar. And now, that I've got everybody right where I want them. I just want to let all the stupid wrestling fans know that you were just as gullible as all those dumb wrestlers in the back that I'm going to start plucking off one at a time. Number one, Hollywood is on a mission. And in Halloween Havoc, when I take that goof with the pain on his face, when I take the warrior, and I prove to him that the running and the hiding from Hollywood only delayed the pain and the torture, that will be the first major move to put the NWO title back on Hollywood's waist. But simply because Hollywood is on a mission. I went down to the hood. And when I went to the hood, all the brothers and the sisters said, Hollywood, why don't you take back over? Why don't you slaughter the lambs that you've had to slaughter? And as I said, brothers, you're right. They said, Wood, do it for us. They said, Wood, take them out one at a time. And the two, biggest crybabies in the WCW. That no good sting and that no good breath the hitman heart. I got Woods war bonnet on tonight and I challenge both of them. If they both want a piece of wood, I'll take them right in the center of the ring and rip them apart, both of them. How about that challenge? How about but that? no matter which way it goes, starting tonight, I'm taking my business back. The black and white NWO is taken over once again. And I don't care if it's Sting. I don't care if it's Bret the Hitman Hart. They're going to be the first victims of the Woods regime, brother, because the black and white is taking over starting tonight. And by the way, brothers, if you're real tight with the Woodmaster like the Nitro girls are, you can just go ahead and call me Woody because I'm just too sweet. What do you say, the boys in the hood? All right, uh, Eric, there's a lot to talk about there. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> uh, he, the, the, the Wood? Uh, we're tight with the wood and uh you can call me woody the nitro girls know and we went down to the hood and they said wood like what uh this is interesting and we're trying new things and as you heard uh, hogan just laid out the challenge to both brett and sting and it's written in the observer that the loss in the ratings from the prior week Actually, it wasn't even written in the observer, by the way, this is the actual nitro open. So we get the street scene now, several minutes into the program, but in the nitro book, it's written that the reaction to the rating the week before September 21st is the reason you guys booked this main event. Uh, as a reminder, the composite rating the week before was nitro did a 3.9 and Monday night raw did a 4.0. 
the next yeah. week, which is where we are now, Nitro is going to be up to a 4.0. So it's up just a little bit, but boy, raw just crushes it. It does a 4.7 and that's with you guys, quote unquote, hot shotting the match. Now I say that term hot shotting, not necessarily that it's even fair. We're going to talk about that, but a lot of people thought, man, Brett versus Hogan, that's a pay-per-view match. Now we established last week, even when you first got your big job as executive producer for WCW that this is a television company, not a wrestling company. So when people are critical of you putting Goldberg and Hogan in July at the Georgia dome on nitro, they should remember that fact. I'm sure the same logic applies here, but is that the way you remember it? That this wasn't the long-term plan to have Brett and Hogan here. It's more of a reaction from the prior week. Or was that just commonplace in this era? We see what the rating is and then we call an audible if necessary. No, we, we, we didn't react to ratings on a week to week basis, particularly when we were winning every week, you know, which we have been doing, as you pointed out up until this point, really. Um, but this was, I think our way, my way of regaining some ground. I didn't like the idea of losing ground. You know, it took me a long time to take over the wrestling television Island and, and feel like we were in control of it. And then to all of a sudden have WWE end up on our shores and starting to take back some of that Island. I did not like that at all. So this was, although typically to answer your question more clearly, typically we did not react and we did have a plan and we did execute that plan. Not that it didn't change along the way as often it does and, and still does to this day, but this was clearly a reaction. This was trying to regain ground, but it was atypical, not typical. We've got super Calo wrestling, um, La Parca in the ring right now. They're going to go five minutes and 32 seconds. Meltzer would say it's a return for both men. That's going to be a corkscrew moonsault block that gets the win for La Parca here. Meltzer would say real good match and fans were into it. Calo hit Parca with a chair a few times after the match. And pounded on the mat near Parka with uh, the chair very hard a few times after that. It seems like um, La Parka at times was was probably one of the more popular luchadors in WCW. How much of that is the costume? How much of that is the style? And how much of that is just the chair, do you think? I, well, I think it's a combination of all of the above, as it usually is. It's the ingredients that ultimately make you know the greatest dish. And you know, you look at La Parka and the other thing I liked about La Parker is he, he, he knew how to go out there and have fun and when to have fun. Yes. He, he was, I don't want to say a comedic character, but he had a great sense of comedic timing and, but he could back it up with physicality and performance. And I think it was the combination of all of the above and the, and the, 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 the costuming was extremely unique, even by, you know, luchador standards. Um, but it was a combination and he, he was a great performer with a great sense of comedic timing and a gimmick that everybody will remember. He was really one of my favorites. I mean, look, Ray Mysterio was in a class by himself the minute he walked through the door at WCW and continues to be. Um, but La Parca in many re respects was one of my favorite luchadors, which sounds weird coming from a guy that hates gimmicks and gimmick matches. Right? Well, but I mean, listen, fun is what, you know, the show needs at different times. And the Parka was always that. And the fans here know it. It's a sellout. There's 10,523 fans here in the building at the Blue Cross Arena in Rochester, New York. 9,814 of them paid $247,660. If you're just listening along and you're not watching, it wasn't just Bischoff holding the mic for Hogan as he's talking about his wood. Uh, <laughs> it was actually uh, Brian Adams and Scott Hall in the black and white with him as well. And it is interesting to think about how quickly and momentum is a funny thing. And we've talked about that a lot here on the program because it is not only a funny thing. It is a very real thing. Uh, I say all that to say six months after we've got this sellout crowd here of 10,523 folks, just six months after this on March 7th in 1999, you guys draw 6,200 and 66 fans. So you're down like 40% in the same market, just six months later, you know, when you're hot, you're hot. And when you're not, you're not. And we've seen some of that 
in the modern product, like WWE not too long ago was struggling to sell tickets. And it felt like, you know, if they ran a house show, they might get 2,500 or 3000. Now they're setting records. Every time they go out in every market, it feels like it's a new record. And conversely, once upon a time where the AEW product was selling tickets left and right, I mean, that was commonplace. They put tickets on sale in Chicago and 10 minutes later, they're gone. That momentum is, is not there. So momentum is a real thing in business. And we're seeing it here play out in WCW where you're talking about, Hey, I don't want to lose ground. And I think a lot of people, when they hear that, they think about a ratings point, but there's more to it than that. It's the overall momentum, including ticket sales and merchandise and pay-per-view it's not just one metric. It's all of them. When you're talking about, losing no, and, and, and television is a good indicator. It's one indicator. It, it's yes. the most immediate indicator. It's the most, um, analyzed in, 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 in measured meter that's available to us as wrestling fans or even in business. But, you know, you mentioned AEW, you know, it wasn't long ago and Arthur Ashe, you know, you, you can go back and find my tweets when it was announced that they were going to Arthur Ashe and it sold out in the first 20 minutes, 20,000 tickets. I was like on the bandwagon and I was cheering and clapping and very excited and congratulated Tony Khan and, and everybody at AEW for, for that achievement. And then it wasn't long till it was down to 50% of that. I think this most recent outing at it, uh, Arthur Ashe was right around 11,000. That's a kind of the same type of drop that we were experiencing here. And it, it's an indicator that you've lost, you've just lost the audience's energy. They, they came, they went and in our case, they came, they saw for a couple of years and then all of a sudden we're not satisfying that need. And they were finding something they enjoyed better over in WWE. And when, when those indicators start to drop it doesn't happen overnight it happens very slowly and sometimes because it happens slowly you can write it off to competition on television you can write it off to the season the time of year what's going on in the nfl or basketball whatever there's always a reason that you can you can justify at least temporarily in your mind but when you're losing 50 percent of your audience in an arena that's the audience telling you something. And the audience was speaking very loud and very clear with us here. Well, we want to speak very loud and very clear right now that Eric and I absolutely love our Henson razors. If you haven't already checked it out, we want you to meet Henson shaving. These cats were actually a family owned aerospace parts manufacturer. No kidding. Before they made razors, they made parts for the international space station and the Mars Rover. And now they're bringing that precision engineering to your face. And they can do this by using those aerospace grade CNC machines. You see, they allow Henson to make the thinnest razors you've ever seen. They're just 0. 0.0013 inches. And I know what you're saying to yourself. You're saying to yourself, self, how thick is that? Well, it's thinner than a human hair. And what that means is a secure and stable blade with a vibration free shave. And it gets better. This razor also has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream. And that makes clogging virtually impossible. What I love really sincerely most about Henson is they have sort of upset the apple cart that we all know, like you were accustomed to, well, if something costs more, it must be better. Think about like an entry level car and then like a, a super primo sweet ride, like one of those six figure jobs. You just know, Hey man, that's going to be, whew. but you also expect that because it costs more. Isn't it awesome when it goes the other way? Not only is it better, but it's more affordable. Well, that's Henson, man. They figured out how to do it because they weren't looking to make the best razor business. See, if they wanted to do that, they would sell you something that was plastic that they switched up every year and changed the new style. And then they'd make you run down to the drugstore and buy something so expensive they keep it under lock and key. That'd be the only way you could make it work. Oh yeah, that's what everybody else does, not Henson. Here, there's no planned obsolescence and not going out of style. If you're watching with us on YouTube, or as a matter of fact, go check it out for yourself. Hensonshaving.com slash 83 weeks. You'll see this razor looks and feels old school, but it's got all the benefits of the new school tech. These are the thinnest razor blades you've ever used. There's nothing on it. That's plastic. There's no proprietary blades. It works with a standard old school razor blade, but you're going to want these super thin blades. And also too, there's no subscriptions. And here's why. Once you buy this razor, this is the last one you'll ever need. 
Now, yes, you will need to buy blades. And I know what you're thinking. Aha, uh -huh, that's where they get you. No, sir. You see, it's three to $5 to replace the blades. Not three to $5 a week, not three to $5 a month, not three to $5 a quarter, three to $5 a year. That's it. How do you beat this? Well, you can't. I want you to check it out. I think you're going to love it. I love mine so much. I've got one down at the beach. I've got one here. I've got one in my travel bag. This is the greatest razor I've ever used. I've even got my barber using it. Everyone at the office now has a Henson because I bragged about it enough. They tried it. They loved it. You will too. Let's say no to subscriptions. Let's say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Let's save some money and get a better shave. Let's visit HensonShaving.com slash 83 weeks. Pick the razor for you and use the code 83 weeks and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just be sure to add them to your cart. Now, I don't want you to get stressed out when I say pick the razor for you. We're just talking about colors. I got a bronze one. I got a black one. I got a blue one. I got a silver one. I'm collecting all of them like Pokemon and these aren't free. I'm buying them because they're fantastic. I love them. That's 100 free blades. We're hooking you up y'all a hundred free blades. When you head to H E N S O N S H A V I N G dot com slash 83 weeks and use the code 83 weeks, Eric, they've been with us a long time now. We can't say enough nice things about them. It really is the best shave of your life. It's a real deal product. It's something we really believe in. This is just one of my favorite products in my real life, man. And you, when I notice the difference, because I have one and I don't travel with it, I bring mm. another uh, razor with me when I travel because I often leave stuff. You know, I'm in a hurry when I leave in the morning and I'm going right. to brain fog unless I've been up for two hours drinking coffee. And I've lost more, you know, razors in hotel rooms than I care to remember. So I travel with a different razor. But when I've been using my Henson razor at home consistently for a week or two, and then take a travel razor with me, that's when I notice the difference. The yes. feel, the close, I mean, the difference in quality is real and you can really feel it. So I, I'm with you, man. I didn't know they had black ones, however, until just this moment. Dude, and I'm going to have to order me a black one because I think that's cool. Hensonshaving.com slash 83 weeks. Be sure to use our promo code 83 weeks. They're going to get you a hundred free blades. Sincerely. I want you to try it. I've never had one complaint. I've never seen one person online in my real life. No one regrets it. It's Hensonshaving.com slash 83 weeks. Use the promo code 83 weeks. This is a fantastic product. I hope you can hear it in my voice. Let's get back to the program. We're watching nitro from September 28th, 1998. We just watched a, a pretty fun luchador match. And, uh, I think we're going to hear from Brad Hart soon. Here we go. Let's get rolling again in three, two, one play. All right. Coast to coast here on TNT upstate New York fall colors. And what a super Monday night on TNT. Please join me as I welcome my guest, my first guest tonight. You know, him well here in upstate New York as he is known around the world, Brett, the Hitman Hart. And Red Hart gets a great ovation for the fans, and I know many things on his mind, including foremost Hollywood Hogan's challenge. Exactly, Tony. This man, of course, has uh, spent a lot of time in this particular building, beautifully renovated now tonight. Earlier, comments from Eric Bischoff and Hollywood Hogan, a man that uh, you never got a title shot at in eight years. Now, all of a sudden, they're calling you out when they know your situation. Oh, yeah, I got a bad knee, but, you know, that's nothing to worry about because this is something that I have waited a lifetime for. Look, Sting and me have agreed backstage he's going to let me have first shot because, Hogan, I have waited forever. You are going to pay for leading me down the wrong path. All the guys that tried to get me from behind, it doesn't matter because I'm going to have people back here. They're going to watch my back. And you and me are going to be alone to settle something that has been building and building and building for years. You ducked from me. You hid from me. You misled me. And it's time for you to settle it with the excellence of execution. The best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. And Hollywood Hogan, when you step in the ring with me, I know that all these people here you talk about heroes and zeros. 
you will be a zero, and all I want is one more chance to be a hero for these people. I can be just as great as Ric Flair. I can be as great as Sting. I can be a true hero. All I want is one chance, and Hogan, I'm going to kick the living crap out of you for everybody in this building and all the buildings around the world. You will pay. All right, thank you very well, much. There we go. That's how we make the match. It's official. A couple things I want to point out. There's a lot of uh, backstory here we should unpack, but I love the idea that we're doing this in New York. Obviously, that was Hulk Hogan's territory long before it was Bret Hart's territory. It is the backyard of WWE to be in upstate New York. Um, but one of the things that stood out to me is when he comes out, there's no music. And I know that we haven't spent a lot of time talking about that, but Brett had such recognizable and iconic WWE music. I just don't feel that way about his WCW theme. And here we didn't even hear it. Why do you, th I mean, do you think that how big of a deal is music to presentation? I mean, how important is that to a character? Like it was a whole vibe for Hollywood Hogan and the NWO and Goldberg and so many others. But with Brett, it's kind of eh, here in WCW and there, we didn't even play it. Huge miss, huge miss on, on my part. You asked the question, how important is it? It's critical. It sets the tone. I mean, how many great movies can you recall that didn't have an identif identifiable soundtrack with it? You know, to this day, every time I hear, you know, Danger Zone, I'm look, thinking back to Top Gun, the first one. You know, there's so, it's such an important part of a character. And I'm, you know, I'm struggling to, to try to remember why we didn't have it. it it's not like it, it was intentional at that point. You know, I was still very hopeful for our relationship with Brad and wanted this thing to work out and I was excited about it. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm just not going to give him any music because he's a dick. It, it, it wasn't that. But it was clearly a miss. There's just no question about it. It changes things. I mean, there's nobody that's a, a major star in, in the sport today that doesn't have identifiable music. It's uh it's a shame. It's a damn shame. Um well, this this match itself has been a long time in the making. There's been so much talk about Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan. And really Dave Meltzer even gives a lot of credit to Tony Schiavone and the announcers for building up how special and how important this match is. Meltzer would say Hart came out to a mixed reaction and accepted Hogan's challenge. And the rest of the show, Tony Schiavone and Mike Tanae did a great job of building up the significance of this being the first two, the first time these two had ever met. Uh, I think Tony sometimes got a bad rap back then. I'm glad he's getting a resurgence these days and people are appreciating him and his talents. And I'm really glad that Mike Tanay is peeking his, uh, head back into the fray just a little bit to go into the impact hall of fame. He's going to accept the award on behalf of himself and Don West. You know, I know that Mike has decided, Hey, wrestling maybe belongs in my rearview mirror, but how cool is that for Mike and for Don to go into the impact hall of fame? I mean, they really were the voice of that company for so long. They were indeed. And I, you know, I think the world of, of Mike today, I think he was such an important part of a critical growth period in, in nitro WCW as a whole. Mike today brought credibility. He was such a great color commentator primary, you know, and it, it became very noticeable when it came to the luchadors because Mike knew backstory and background in detail in the information that literally added color to the picture that we were presenting with the luchadors in the cruiserweight division on nitro. I don't think that the cruiserweight division would have had the success that it did or had the impact that it did in nitro and therefore, and subsequently in the industry today, had it not been for the credibility and the interest that Mike today was able to bring to it because of his vast knowledge and recall and ability to weave it into the action and the story that we were presenting. It's, it was an art and there wasn't anybody else that could do it. There was no one else that could do what Mike today did. So I, I 
nothing but respect for Mike. Like I said, he was such a critical part of WCW Nitro and, and the evolution of it. And glad to see that he's going out there and taking a bow once again, and particularly, you know, receiving it, uh, his award along with and for Don West, because I know those two were tight. I can't wait to uh, talk more about this Hogan Bret Hart thing, but before I do, I want to remind people, if you're just listening and you're not watching along with us, as we're seeing the talking heads at the announced position, we just saw disciple, the former Brutus, the freaking barber beefcake beat sick boy in a minute and 58 seconds. And what's he using as a finisher? Well, it's a stunner. And Meltzer would say the show started falling apart here. Fans booed the hell out of disciple, even though he's supposed to be with warrior. Actually, maybe because of that and partially because he's the cycle. And then the match started and they went to sleep. He no sold everything poorly. Meltzer was always brutal about Ed Leslie here in WCW. And I have to admit, I was a huge Brutus, the barber beefcake fan as a kid over in the WWF, but it felt like nothing he ever did here in WCW really hit. And you've talked about how, when you hired Hogan, that came with, uh, well, another cast of characters. You had some tag alongs. I know he was one of them, but was there a scenario where you guys could have captured lightning in a bottle for him? The way, I mean, the Brutus care character over in the WWF was an act. I mean, he was over, he was selling merch. He was selling posters. People were, I mean, little kids were dressing up and doing the cutting and it just never hit in WCW. Was that a gimmick for a different time and place? Was he not able to be nimble and create another character Did WCW creative, just feel forced to come up with him or uh, something to do at, rather than being excited to come up with something. Why didn't it work? I mean, nothing worked. <laughs> I, I think it, you know, Brutus, the barber beefcake in, in WWE, then WWF worked because that product was produced and targeted to teens and preteens. All of the char characters were very animated. They were human cartoons and Brutus, the barber beefcake, the character and Leslie, the performer was probably almost perfect for that era in that character being targeted towards that audience. Now we're in a different era in terms of television. Nitro is, had decidedly made the move to an 18 to 30, 18 to 49 year old demo. That was the underserved audience that I recognized before the day we launched the first Nitro and recognized that in order to be different than the WWE at the time, I had to present the product differently. And I chose to present it and target the 18 to 49 year old demo with a more reality, ba reality based, more believable, less cartoonish, not a hundred percent across the board. So all you keep keyboard geeks out there they're going to go yeah but what about the dungeon of doom again not across the board there were still some very animated characters for that segment of the audience that liked it but now you've got ed leslie portraying a character within the context of the nwo and the more reality-based presentation that we were assigning to that and he didn't have it Ed Leslie, as a performer, was a very, very weak performer. He was great at being the barber, but he didn't have the talent or the instinct to adapt and to embrace a character that would appeal to that 18 to 49-year-old demo. It was classic square peg round hole, and it didn't work, and we were forced. What well, is the Bruce, and then he was the booty man, and was the disciple and then he was whatever else the hell he was all of that was a reflection of the fact that we couldn't find anything to make this guy work but he was part of the package and we had to give him some tv time and and and, and put him in a position where he could do the least amount of damage to the product as possible that's horrible to have to say that but it's true we uh we see the uh the nitro girls doing their thing and uh, next up our next match is going to be something that I don't think you maybe even knew happened. Maybe it was discussed once upon a time, but I think we're going to have Scott Steiner come out and do his thing. And it's going to be what I believe to be a handicap match. And the two opponents for Scott, as I understand it here are going to be Lenny lane. And I'm going to let you see if you can figure out who his opponent is. And we're seeing 
God, I love Buff Bagwell. What a hateable character this was. The airbrushed white um, overalls here. I mean, is Buff the most annoying slash best hype man? He is like the rest, wrestling's version of Flavor Flav in this era. <laughs> That's awesome. That is awesome. And Scotty's looking unbelievable here. I mean, guy was looking awesome. But, yeah, you're right. Bagwell was – he had the most punchable face in the, in the business back then. And he had and the, the character to go along with it, which made it work. And that's money, man. You know, I mean, there's money in being hated. And I think sometimes that's what wrestling is missing today. Is Heat is guy. life, brother. Heat is life. You can't have a baby face. If you don't have a heel with heat, come on. Simple. It's math. I actually bought one of those, uh, buff Bagwell hats and flipped it back in 2013. He was unloading one of these at the nwa legends fan fest and i was like dude somebody's one of my collector buddies they're gonna flip to have that on their shelf and they did like a week later 2x so hey in the ring we got lenny lane with another fellow let's see if you can recognize who it is eric i'm not going to tell you i'm going to let you guess oh it'll be tough for you let's listen to scott steiner as you try to figure it out when I step in the ring, that all men are not created equal. And if there's a professional athlete that looks as great as I, that I do, I'd like to see him because he don't exist. Look at the back. The Let left. Take it. Boy, the trapezius, the lats in the back, he's just so powerful. And now... What do you think, Eric? Do you recognize who that is? Absolutely not. You're not going to believe it. Are you ready? That's Eugene. That's Get Nick out of here, really? Yep, he was on Nitro. How about that? I knew you wouldn't remember that. Wow. Look at him. That's a young Eugene right there. Man, I can barely, even now that you've told me, I can't really see it. Well, I mean, that character was so different than what we're seeing here, but that's the real life Nick Dinsmore teaming up with Lenny Lane. Uh, Scott, of course, is going to take approximately zero bumps and just throw these guys all around and beat them both with a double camel clutch. You heard me right. A double camel clutch. I think wrestling needs more of this. I think uh, there's a lot of, uh, stress and emphasis sometimes to make sure that everything on TV is a good match. But in reality, a little squash action never hurt nobody. This is how you uh, get guys you're over. Gonna, you're still going to build characters. Yes. You know, they, I mean, look, there was a point in time, and it's one of the big cr criticisms that I got early on with Nitro is I'm giving away pay per view quality matches on free TV. I heard that a lot. Yeah. And now it's kind of commonplace, right? We We see it often now. When Nitro first started and I was putting those big names on television and putting pay-per-view quality matchups on television, you know, the the peripheral wrestling industry, the Dave Meltzers of the world, all, you know, prescribe nothing but doom and gloom as a result. And we all know what really happened. But you still need, I think, to this day, occasionally those squash matches to just, if not get somebody over to keep them over and, and just maintain their position and yes. And, and just clean up that character from time to time. It's, uh, it's necessary. I think, I mean, if you take a look at, you know, these, let's just hit the reset button on Goldberg. He's going to debut tomorrow. It's not September of 97 anymore. He's debuting tomorrow and he's going to go out and try to have a great 50, 50 match in his first match on TV, the Goldberg character never gets off the ground. No, it never happens. And, and, and I think it's important to remember, like when people talk about box office, the people who are box office are the people who are dominant. Like you look at Mike Tyson in this era, you know, since the eighties at this point, we've got 10 years of Mike Tyson being a huge box office attraction. And it's because he's just mowing through people. Much like we're seeing Steiner here. Look at this, not one, but two. A double camel clutch. Yes, it's silly. Yes, it's a gimmick. Yes, it's awesome. 
I love me some Scott Steiner. What a great segment that was. It was a great segment. By the way, shout out to Nick Patrick, who we're seeing here as a ref. I had an opportunity to go down to Atlanta and work with Nick and his his team over at Deep South Wrestling, and I had an absolutely wonderful time. I learned more about smoking a brisket than I ever thought possible, and I'm grateful for the knowledge that I uh, that I received while I was down there. But Nick is a great guy. He's doing a great job coaching and working with a, a great, great group of young talent. So shout out to Nick. Thanks for the invite, Nick. I had a great time. We should remind everybody that, uh, we're watching this nitro because the main event is Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart. And, uh, we've all talked ad nauseum about, man, this is the first time they've wrestled and they've never wrestled before. Well, that's not exactly true. It turns out if you roll over to a cage match, you see that They've been in the same ring on at least 20 different occasions, including way back in 1984, Eric, over in Japan, Whoa. Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan were tag team partners in Japan. Wow. Against guys like Anoki and Fujinami. That's real. And then when the mega powers got up and going and they were hotter than ever in 1988, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage, they would wrestle the Hart foundation and the honky tonk man in a handicap match. Of course, they'd share the ring and a couple of Royal Rumbles. But after 1991, they wouldn't touch uh, until 1998. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, we should remind you that not everybody can look like Scott Steiner. But maybe we can do a little better. And with the fall season getting busy and already in full swing, you might be looking for wholesome, convenient meals for jam-packed days. Got to pick those kids up from school. Got to get them to ball practice. Well, hey. Let's lean on Factor, America's number one ready-to-eat meal kit. They can help you fuel up fast for breakfast, lunch, and dinner with chef-prepared, dietitian-approved, ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. You'll save time, you'll eat well, and you'll stay on track with your healthy lifestyle. Maybe you're too busy to cook. Well, man, with Factor, you get to skip the trip to the grocery store, you get to skip the chopping, you get to skip the prepping, and you get to skip the cleaning up, too. And you still get the flavor and the nutritional quality you really need. It's all thanks to Factors, fresh, never frozen meals that are ready in just two minutes. All you got to do is heat and enjoy and then get back to your goals. And you can adjust your stride this autumn without missing a step because they've got 35 different weekly flavor packed, fresh, never frozen meals that do promote a healthy lifestyle and they're all ready to eat in under two minutes. Don't take our word for it. Check out some of these dishes, man. Cranberry pecan chicken, apple Dijon pork chops. They're both ready in just two minutes. It's going to satisfy all your fall cravings during the busy season without the hassle. Level up with gourmet plus options, prepared to perfection by chefs and ready to eat in record time. Treat yourself to upscale meals with premium ingredients like broccolini and leeks and truffle butter, even asparagus. And maybe you're worried about lunch. Well, they got you covered there too. Lunch to go. You can actually do wholesome meals like grain bowls and salad toppers. They're ready to eat when you're on the go. No microwave required. Maybe you're wanting to be calorie conscious. Well, how about these dietitian approved and delicious calorie smart meals that are just 550 calories or less. I know our buddy double J he's rocking the protein plus meals. They've got 30 grams of protein or more per servings. And by the way, we should also mention they got all your other stuff. You need breakfast? No problem. How about some apple cinnamon pancakes or some bacon and cheddar egg bites? They've even got fun snacks like the shakes and the juices and the smoothies. Whatever you're looking for, they got it here. Factor can hook you up this October. You simply choose your meals and then you enjoy the very fresh flavor packed meals delivered right to your door and they're ready in just two minutes. There's no prep. There's no mess. Head right now to factormeals.com slash 83 weeks 50 and use the code 83 weeks 50 to get 50% off. That's code 83 weeks 50 at factormeals.com slash 83 weeks 50 to get 50% off. All right, Eric, let's get back to the program. We're watching a very special Monday Nitro from September 28th, 1998. They went to a commercial break because uh, Scott Steiner hurt his back. Wink, wink. Uh, this is an ongoing angle on Nitro that he can't have the big competition matches. He just needs. Uh, little workout routine. So he's uh, dodging big matches by feigning an injury. So it's a pretty nice little storyline. Let's pick it up where we left off. And I think we've got the warrior coming out. So I know you're excited about that. Oh, let's go. strap ourselves in. Come on in now. Three, two, one. 
play. Up and running, ladies and gentlemen, with the beginning of the second hour. We told you about the two top contender cruiserweight bouts we have coming up. I bet Jericho's challenge to Goldberg to go one on one here tonight. But in the face of it all, the one match that looms bigger than anything else is the fact that Bret Hart and Hollywood Hogan will wrestle here tonight live on this program. It's Monday Nitro. You come to expect matches such as these. A very, very dark tone that's set here now over the, the arena. The scope and locked for destruction. Take the target out. Oh my, look at this, look, in the entryway, he has arrived again, we've come to expect the unexpected from the warrior, and there's the man that has turned Hollywood Hogan's world upside down. Alright, so we cut the audio for a minute. Big presentation, big theme music, big like show, big pyro, big excitement. From Tony Schiavone and Mike Tanay, they're doing what they can. Uh, Meltzer would say Warrior showed up without the steam, as I hope they've learned from the other cities and TV ratings that nerve gas kills ratings. Unfortunately, as this reaction shows, it wasn't the nerve gas, it's Warrior himself. He got cheered coming out, but ultimately was being booed out of the place with loud Warrior sucks chants. A fan hit the ring in the middle of this interview, and again, he forgot what he was supposed to say. Just an awful segment. It isn't as if everyone didn't warn Bischoff about Warrior going to have a very short life, like two or three weeks, of being effective because he isn't adapting to 1998 wrestling, which is a totally different world than 1992, and the wrestling world isn't going to change to adapt to him. The only thing left for him to do besides kill the ratings and buy rates after Havoc, which still may do well just because of the matchup after more than eight years, is for Goldberg to spear him and chalk it up to experience. I can't tell you how many people within WCW were predicting that by five weeks in the fans would be begging for Goldberg to spear him. And here we are. He would also write. It's no secret within the company that warrior is dying and the realization that unless something is done quickly, he's taking Hogan down with him. They may do a good buy rate for the next pay-per-view Halloween havoc, although it's going down and not escalating with every bit of hype they added to the mix. You know, I know we, you have a lot of fun being critical of, of Meltzer's reporting and his opinions at times, but it is hard to argue that man, instead of this building anticipation for the match, it feels like every segment he's in, it actually whittles it down. Right. It does. And you know, Dave had the same commentary about Randy Savage, about Hulk Hogan. When I brought Hulk Hogan, you know, in Dave's opinion, those people all washed up were never going to amount to anything. It was a bad investment. It was a bad choice on Eric Bischoff's part to bring those guys in. Clearly, he was wrong then. So the fact that Dave Meltzer felt that way, or others like Dave Meltzer may have felt that way, if I would have listened to those morons early on, Nitro would have never happened. Hogan would have never come in. The NWO would have never happened. A lot of things would have never happened if anybody would have taken the guidance, particularly me, of people like Dave Meltzer. That being said, he wasn't always wrong. And I think with Warrior, it was a, let's give it a try and see what happens. My expectations weren't nearly as high as people may have thought they were. It really was it was an expensive experiment, but my expectations were very well managed. When, when I had the opportunity to bring Randy in, I had very high expectations. Randy over delivered. When I yeah. brought Hulk Hogan in, I had very high expectations. Hulk Hogan way over delivered. That was the case in a, in a lot of those situations, bringing somebody over who was supposedly washed up in, in WWE at the time, but warrior was the exception to that. Just, and I mean, it's right here, you know, and I, I could kick myself in the ass all afternoon just looking at the amount of mic time that I gave this guy because it was very clear, particularly after his first outing. This was not his strong suit. And I was thinking about that when he made his entrance and listening to the crowd. You know, if there's ever been a personification of less is more, it's Warrior. 
at this time. Yeah. I agree. Had he not had that mic, had he if he would have been more of a mystery type of a character that very rarely spoke, and when he did, it actually mattered because it happened so infrequently. I think things might have turned out differently, but he was he, meaning Warrior, was so stuck in trying to recreate that WWE phenomenon that Dave was right in this case. He couldn't adapt. He didn't have much like Bruce the Barber Beefcake, couldn't adapt and couldn't evolve in an environment where he needed to. It's uh, something you're trying. I mean, obviously, we know that no bad idea in a brainstorming session. And once upon a time, this was a big match that a lot of people wanted. And we know that Hogan had success with this in the past. So why not? I mean, we've done Hogan Savage here, it worked. We did Hogan and the giant because unfortunately Andre is not available and it worked. Why not Hogan and the warrior and, and Hogan and- flair. Now it's yeah. kind of, it's almost, um, a wrestling sin to compare Hogan warrior to Hogan flair, but in context, same thing, you know, that's what kicked off Hulk Hogan's career in WCW was his match with flair and the storyline with flair. Again, can't compare the two performers in any right. stretch of the imagination, but it's going back to what either did work or what could have worked and people wanted to see in WWE that they got to see in WCW. We've got Mean work. Gina here doing a stick man job here with Buff Bagwell. Let's track it. Give me a second. I just had to put Scotty in the ambulance. He's on the way to the hospital. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. To stop right there. We don't know what to believe. Is he really on the way to the hospital? Wait a second, Gina. Are you calling me a liar? Are you calling me a liar? Say the words. Are you calling me a... Shut your mouth! <laughs> I'm asking you a question. Are you calling Buff Daddy a liar? I'm not calling you anything. I'm asking the questions here. You're not asking them. This simple, Gene. You know how, how hard Scotty Steiner works. Just look at his body. He's a dedicated man. He that? wanted to resolve this match at Halloween. Ha- what the hell? Oh, yeah, that's what, what you think it is. Are you laughing at me now? I'm not laughing. I'm not what lying. What is that noise? I don't have a clue what it is. I don't know where it's coming from. All I know is Scotty Steiner wanted to work this thing out. The holidays are coming up. Everybody knows he's got three ruptured discs in his lower back. Gene, he may have four, five, he may have six now. I don't know. I just I just knew he wanted to work this thing out, Gene. Is he going to be ready to meet his brother, Rick Steiner, at Halloween Havoc in the return that has been ordered by J.J. Dillon? Gene, does it look like the words doctor are across my forehead? Do you <laughs> see the words doctor anywhere? I don't know. Don't jerk me around out here, Bank. Hello? I'm not a doctor. All I can tell you is Scott Steiner's hurt. And havoc may not happen, so just suck it up, Rick Steiner, because the holidays may be miserable. Thank you very much, Buff Bagwell. So, Tony back uh, here, do you friend. remember what the laugh was, Eric? Was that Chucky? It was Chucky. They're getting ready to promote Bride of Chucky a couple weeks from now. We're going to have the doll do a promo battle with Rick Steiner. But, yeah, during Buff Bagwell, we just pipe in uh, the Chucky laugh. which It's a little is- tease. I like it. I like yeah. it. By the way, I think that was some of Buff's best character work on the mic. No doubt. I mean, that was really, really well done. This is such a fun time for WCW. And I know that uh, people get tired of me saying how much I love this era, but we're about to watch Psychosis wrestle Ernest Miller. How great is that? <laughs> like, that's <laughs> fun. That's fun. That is a hoot. And that, you know, goes back to, you know, I don't know who came up with it. I didn't originate it. Maybe it was Dusty Rose, but for me, I've, I've used the analogy, I guess, where wrestling, when it's done really well, it's a, it's a great buffet. You've got a little bit of everything, you know, you satisfy everybody that comes into the door and that's what we're seeing here on nitro. Even, even, you know, at the tail end of nitro's dominance, you're still seeing, I think a well-balanced presentation. We, uh, we both love Ernest Miller and we're talking a lot about matches today. We started down this train of talking about Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan. 
And I mentioned that they actually were tag team partners back in 84 over in Japan twice. Uh, once in a tag match that included Anoki on the other side, once in a tag match that included Fujinami on the other side. Uh, and then of course they had a, a lot of matches that were superstars tapings and maybe dark matches where they're in the main event, uh, in tag affairs. Of course, Brett was a part of the heart foundation, Hulk Hogan on the other side. And then a couple of, uh, one superstars match that was actually here in uh, Huntsville, Alabama of all places. That's where the mega powers would take on the heart foundation and the honky talk man. But after those Royal rumbles where they shared the ring together in 90 and 91, never again until a dark match where we did Savage and Piper against Brett and Hogan in Rhode Island in uh, May of 98 here on Nitro. And again, we had Brett and Hogan team up against DDP and Kevin Nash. That was at the Palace of Auburn Hills in June of 98. Also in June on Thunder, we would see Brett and Hogan team up against DDP and Kevin Nash. We saw that match at the Great American Bash on pay-per-view in Baltimore. That was Savage and Piper against Brett and Hogan. And then we recently talked about, you know, the, the record, if you will, um, which was Lex Luger and Sting taking on Brett and Hogan. That did record business uh, August 31st, the highest rated Nitro in history. And then, of course, we did the war games, which was an interesting one. It's three teams, nine guys, Team WCW, Team NWO, and Team Wolfpack. Uh, team NWO Hollywood is Brett Hogan and Stevie Ray, of all people. And now we're watching this match, the first singles match that ever happened. And uh, it's at the Blue Cross Arena here in Rochester. But that wouldn't be the last time they would hook it up, believe it or not. It would happen over and over and over again, but usually non-televised house shows. They would share the ring at a uh, Nitro in October. Two weeks after this one, it would be Sting teaming up with the Warrior against Bret Hart and Hogan. That seems crazy, but they actually did a series of house show matches, Eric. The Cow Palace out in San Francisco in uh, August of 99. They would do it in Reno, Nevada the very next day. The following day, they're at the Forum in Inglewood, California. And then of all places, a few weeks later, Pensacola, Florida, and then Tallahassee, Florida. All of those matches, every single one of them, no contest finishes. I find that interesting. Hogan was the champ. He didn't lose. Brett didn't lose. No contest. It's a house show, Eric. Why not do a clean finish on a house show? There were issues, obviously, between with Hogan and Brett in managing managing them both based on their own strongly held beliefs and perspectives was a challenge. It was a compromise. Every one of those no contest finishes was a compromise. They were both deeply embedded in their positions. And it was hard to get them off of it. It was one of the reasons why we never really had the ultimate match with them that we wanted to have in the buildup is the chemistry between them. Now, they could be around each other. They could work together in the same ring, as you outlined many, many times. But when it came to being in the main event for the title, man, that was just, it was just tough chemistry. So it's the only way I can say it really. I don't mean to say it this way. Cause it's going to sound like I'm trying to come off negative, but I'm not trying to, I'm just trying to understand. Like I've had conversations with Hulk Hogan in real life. And he even talked about this on, on Joe Rogan's podcast where he would say, I went to Piper and I was like, brother, if you just want to let me pin you, you know, I could have done it back and then you could have got the belt and we could have did the chase and we could have made some money, but I couldn't trust you to do it. And you couldn't trust me to do it. And he clearly understood that, you know, some of these guys, quote unquote, didn't want to pin their shoulders to the mat. And that to me seems, I don't know, a little silly because he he's doing it for Goldberg this same year. He's doing it. He did it for Piper, uh, a couple of years prior to this at nitro. I mean, uh, at Starcade. he did it for sting. What was it? I mean, uh, I, on the one hand, I think people would say, well, he's not at my level because he's not as big as me. But again, no, I don't, that, that wasn't it. I, I think it's not bigger. Sting's not bigger. 
I think it. Uh, it's hard to say. I can't get into either of their heads, to be honest. I only know what I was told, and it's not that I believe necessarily everything that I was told because I only heard one side of it. Well, actually, I heard both sides of it. But Brett had a very strong belief that Hogan screwed him in WWE. Yes. Talked Vince out of an opportunity for Brett. And it's my opinion, could be wrong, but that feeling, that resentment, that distrust that Brett held for Hogan never went away. And the lack of respect when it comes to business, when it came to business, the lack of respect, trust that Hogan had for Brett was real. And again, you could get them to work together in the same ring. They could hang out. They could be together in a, on the roster. There was no heat per se visible in, in terms of their ability to work together until and unless it came time to make it actually mean something. And that lack of trust, resentment, call it what you will, from 1993 or whenever it happened or 92, I don't know, I don't remember the dates, but that initial opportunity and, and the way it was explained to me from, from Hulk was that Vince McMahon made a lot of promises to Brett along the way but had a different conversation with Hulk mm. at the same time. So when it came time to resolve the issue, because Brett was pushing that issue because of what he was told as he should have, if indeed he was told by Vince McMahon that something was going to happen and kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and not fully committing to it, Brett called it out. They finally ended up in a room together with Vince and Vince basically denied it yep. and went with Hogan. I, I wasn't there. And I don't necessarily believe 100% of what any one person tells me when there's two or more people involved. Because everybody, everybody hears things differently. They have a different perspective. Their emotions are at different levels. All of that affects what really happened. Yes. So it's impossible for me to take a hundred percent of anybody's opinion about anything when there's more than one person involved, two people involved. But the way it was explained to me, it makes it easy for me to understand why Brett was as entrenched as Brett was when it came to Hogan and, and still carried around some of that distrust and resentment. It's also easy for me to understand from Hulk's point of view, why he didn't really have a lot of respect for Brett in some regards professionally. Hulk obviously recognized what we all did is that when it came to his work in the ring, Brett was second to maybe only Ric Flair. And even that's arguable, you know, depending on your perspective at the time. But when it came to doing business, which is a different, it's a wrestling way of saying, trusting the guy you're in there with, that was the issue. There was a lack of trust. Well, a lack of trust is obviously critical in wrestling, but it is one of those things where I just can't help but wonder what if, I mean, it feels like sometimes for the greater good, we should just be able to put things aside. I mean, when we hear about problems today in modern wrestling, this guy doesn't want to work with that guy. It feels like everybody gets up in arms and takes sides and it's divisive. I don't know, dude. Well, look at, I mean, look at, look at what happened with CM Punk and, yeah. and the elite. And, and we don't even know how much of that is true because it was a lot of it was regurgitated, created, blown out of proportion, exploited by the Dave Meltzer's of the world. Right. We, unless you were there, you know, who knows? CM Punk may be completely justified, or you may have been an egomaniac that was overreacting and, and, and being a bully, so to speak. Nobody knows for sure, but what we do know for sure is the lack of trust and the resentment, much like existed with Hulk Hogan and Bret Hart, can and has still exist today. I mean, it just it is that's the thing about wrestling, man. It's it's a unique business. You 
know, maybe actors and actresses have the same types of situations because they have to expose themselves as characters in whatever movie or television series are doing and they're vulnerable. They're out there performing and they have to have a certain amount of trust. You know, you're acting is nothing but reacting. It's one of the reasons Buff Bagwell's interview with, with Gene Okerlund went as well as it did because yeah. Buff had an idea what he was going to say, but he wasn't working off a, a script. He was no. reacting in a very natural, believable way to what Gene, who is an artist, nothing less than an artist at being that stick man. It's easy to say, oh, he's a stick man. Uh -huh. he's, a, he's a very, very important part of the equation. But Buff did a great job of reacting to Gene. Actors and actresses react to each other. Yes, they're working off of a script and they know where the direction of the story is going, sometimes word for word. But you have to make it look believable like you're reacting to what you're hearing for the first time. That all takes trust. And clearly, Tony Khan couldn't bring those camps together in AEW, just like I couldn't bring Brett and Hogan together sufficiently to be able to really exploit the opportunity. Chemistry is a real thing, dude. It's a, it's a real thing. You can have all of the talent in the world. You can have, you can have 99.99% of everything you need, but if the one tenth of 1% that's lacking is trust, you got nothing. Matter. You got nothing. Hey, let me ask you, you know, people would say in this era, something they've said in more recent years about AEW, all the inmates are running the asylum. How do you answer that when it comes to personality like Hogan and Brett? I mean, is that, is that as simple as it is? Oh, the inmates are running the asylum. There's, I mean, you don't share well, it. It's simple for someone that's never worked in the industry to say that it's a simple observation go. for fans who read stupid shit in their sheets to say that because it's easy to repeat. It's like bumper sticker mentality. And, you know, bumper sticker mentality works. It works in politics. It works in wrestling. It works in a lot of situations. But egos, I mean, just step back from them. And by the way, before I go on here, I want to put over this match. Disco looks freaking awesome here. This is a great match. It's Disco and Chavo Guerrero. Chavo, you know, Chavo, is, work, man. Chavo is unbelievable here. It's the more serious side of Chavo, which I really, really enjoyed. Yeah. But. Got, got to put Disco over here as well. He takes a lot of heat, gets a lot of crap, mostly because he asked for it because that's yes, kind of who does. he is and that's his character. Yes. But you can't discount his ability back then either. He looked awesome. Oh, there I was just talking about how serious Java was and he's riding a stick pony, so whatever. But where was I? Going back to chemistry. Going back to, oh, it's just the inmates running asylum. I don't care if you're a director on a movie set. How many stories have we heard about actors and actresses on a movie set that just can't get along in the nightmares oh, yeah. that ensue, right? Going over budget, delaying production, having to recast characters in the middle of a movie. Those things are real because the people involved have different egos than the people that buy tickets to go watch them. They're driven differently than the average person. That's why they become stars. It's why they pursue being a star. And their egos are different, not worse, not better, just different. And managing people that are performers, that are driven to perform partly because of their egos, are very difficult to manage. And shit is going to happen. It just does. It happens and probably still does in WWE. It certainly happened in WCW. It happens currently in AEW. And guess what? It probably happens on movie sets and television sets all over the planet because performers are different and they have to be managed differently. And sometimes they can't be managed. We're watching a, a pretty fun match here with uh, Disco Inferno and Chavo Guerrero. Uh, I want to remind everybody this show is happening in Rochester, New York. And uh, when you saw Mean Gene introduce Bret Hart, he says, Oh, we're in a building that um, I think he, uh, Bret the Hitman Hart is very familiar with. That's the phrase he used. But what he was referencing is Bret's been wrestling here in Rochester since 1985 with the WWF. He had matches against Rene Goulet, Rick McGraw, Paul Roma, 
he actually wrestled with his uh, tag team partner, Jim Neidhart against a team called the American express. Yeah. You heard me right. The American express that was Danny Spivey and Mike Rotundo. Uh, but he also had some pretty interesting matches against teams like, uh, Pedro Morales and Tito Santana and defending the tag team titles against Davey boy Smith and the junkyard dog. I know what you're thinking. Wait, when did they tag? Well, it's because he was standing in for the dynamite kid, but oh yeah, he wrestled the dynamite kid in singles action here back in 86. I'm not necessarily interested in running through all the matches that he had here, but the point is he had a lot of great matches with a lot of great talent in the company, including some pretty notable ones. I want to run through. He wrestled Shawn Michaels here for the intercontinental title. He wrestled Mr. Perfect here for the intercontinental title. Lots of defenses for the tag titles when he and Jim were the tag champs, but he would also work with Jerry Lawler in 1993. And more importantly, Stone Cold Steve Austin at a pay-per-view here in 1997 in your house, revenge of the taker. This is the fabulous Bret Hart is a heel in America, but a baby face around the rest of the world taking on, you know, the antagonist or the protagonist or depending on where you lived. Uh, the anti-hero, I guess, is the better phrase, Stone Cold Steve Austin. But this is also the same building where way back in 1986, and this became wrestling lore, he had that 10-minute match with Tom McGee. And that was sort of the the lost tape that everybody was obsessed with for years and years and years. It happened in this building. And I'm sure that Tom McGee probably had a different trajectory and, and maybe the company felt like he had a different one. It just didn't work out. And sometimes in life, things don't work out. And that makes us want to talk about mental health. Mental health is an increasingly important and it's really something none of us like to talk about or address publicly. Let me ask you this. Are you feeling stuck or does your mind have you dressing sharp, but feeling dull? Perhaps it's time to talk to a life coach. We'll meet fellow ad-free show supporter and wrestling fan, Steve, from a damn healthy dose of coaching. Steve is a certified ADHD life coach and getting you unstuck is what he does, period. Working together, you'll come up with strategies and he'll provide you with the tools you need to set you on the way. To learn more, visit damnhealthydose.com. That's D-A-M-N healthydose.com or email Steve at damnhealthydose.com. That's Steve S T E E V at damnhealthydose.com for a free 30 minute consultation. Be sure to mention 83 weeks and Steve will provide you with the first two sessions for free to see if life coaching is a fit for you. Don't wait. If you're feeling stuck, visit damnhealthydose.com. All right, Eric, let's get back to nitro. Here we go. We're watching September 28th, 1998, getting ready for Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan, just around the corner. Here we go in three, two, one play. Oh, look at this. A little four horsemen promo. Remember now flair came back two weeks prior seeing some jcp clips some wcw clips it's a fun little package i don't remember seeing this before I'm sure me I did. neither it was done very well too i like the black and white touch seeing mongo here and benoit with malenko the nature boy Power four. And that's a cool look. That's pretty cool. All right, we are on the shank of another Monday evening. As promised, ladies and gentlemen, they are back together again. In upstate New York, across the country and around the world, please welcome the four horsemen. It truly is a magical moment. Anytime they're announced by Gene Okerlund, anytime they make their way to the ring, the legacy of the horsemen, what they've meant to this sport. And well, we can cut the audio here. You see Mike Tanay and Tony Schiavone doing their best to hype up the return of the horsemen upstate New York. Of course, JCP used to run 
uh, New York as well. And, uh, here's our group, even though it's four, it's like the original four, except in the JJ role, it's Arn Anderson. Of course, Mongo, uh, just recently announced as going into the NFL hall of fame, kudos to him and, uh, Dean Malenko still doing his thing in AEW along with Arn Anderson, the nature boy, uh, besides getting yelled at by you on every other 83 weeks, it has a new mushroom energy drink. What are the odds you try the new mushroom energy drink here? Oh, I'll try it. I know you would like the mushroom. I, hell yeah. I'll give that a shot. <laughs> I've, I, I've been known to love me some mushrooms, by the way. Don't, don't sleep on the mushrooms. Uh, Eric, I mean, Eric, uh, Rick tells me that, man, you'll get all wired up on these. It is a real deal energy drink. And, uh, I've yet to try it. It's not yet made its way to, uh, to my market. But, uh, when I go visit, uh, pop pop, I'll be sure to, uh, give you a report back. And believe it or not, I don't know if you remember this, but you're about to make an appearance here and uh, remind everybody about what just happened on thunder, uh, where I guess, uh, Stevie Ray was on the bad side of, a an Arn Anderson ass whooping. Let's take a listen. the second Eric Bischoff Stevie Ray we just, uh, welcome back God God Woo. and in case you haven't noticed I brought a few of the local law enforcement with me because you my friend committed felonious assault on this man on Thursday you know it, I know it, and the world knows it. So here's how it's going to go, because none of these people want to hear another word from you. Trust me. I want local law enforcement to step forward. I want you to take this man, this man, this man, and this disgrace to the wrestling business. Oh, my. Oh. And I want you to escort them along with this man. Since you failed to do your job last week, I brought a little help to make sure you got it done this week. And get them the hell out of my building. And you can do that now. Thank you very much. Good night, gentlemen. This is my show. Remember? Well, unfortunately, this is all Good night, gentlemen. Can you spell felonious assault? Let me help you out. I, I, it's like a knock on the head. <laughs> Good night, Aaron. You're done. What an asshole. Listen to the fans. The fans with their response, but uh, wouldn't it take some uh, the police force... Uh, from Norfolk, Virginia to uh, lock him up. Bye, Rick. Bye, Dean. Good to see you again. Hey, Mongo, see you next time. Hey, they're going to like you in prison. <laughs> now, the horseman, uh, Doug Dellinger included. Did you ever think you'd see Doug Dellinger being led away by a police officer? So it's here's what Meltzer says. No, he says, um, Bischoff, Flair said a few words, and almost immediately Bischoff came out with a million officers and started screaming at Arn about felonious assault because of what he did on Thunder to Stevie Ray. The cops escorted not only the horseman, but also Doug Dillinger out of the building. Shivani was hilarious later in the show when another fan hopped the guardrail, and he said, that's what happens when you send Dillinger out of the building. And supposedly they went to jail. There are a lot of people in wrestling who deserved to be arrested after their interviews, but Flair isn't one of them. Bischoff started ripping Flair about using his 10 year old to hide behind as an excuse for not showing up. 
given how bad the show was, it would have been nice to hear Flair talk longer and Anderson talk a little, but it was a good angle. It is a good angle. I like the angle, but do you think in hindsight, I only bring this up because I recently covered a, uh, a Monday night raw with Jr. And it was on the, around the 20 year anniversary of a 2003 pay-per-view where there was a match set up between Goldberg and triple H and seemingly out of nowhere for no real reason. We had stone cold come out and do a 20 minute interview and Meltzer would say, Hey, even if the interview didn't have a lot of substance and it didn't go anywhere, nobody's changing the channel when stone cold, Steve Austin's in the ring, holding a microphone. And I kind of feel that way about flair here. Like he had been such a hot property two weeks ago. You had that blistering moment where he comes back and you guys are fire me. I'm already fired shouting match. That was great TV. And here we cut his water off before we hear from him. I know that's quote unquote heat brother, but in hindsight, should you have let him talk a little bit? I mean, that would have been good for ratings. No, you know, I was thinking the exact same thing as I'm watching this. Cause I, you know, obviously I forgot about this. I didn't know it was coming up and I thought the overall, the scene was pretty good. You know, the, the angle, whatever you want to call it. It was really pretty good. It was effective, but if I were able to do it again, I would have let, I would have heard more from Rick, a little bit more, not a lot more. I would have wanted to hear from Arn because he was the subject, right? Yes. He was the reason. So to not hear from Arn was a mistake creatively. I, I think it would have been better for Rick to set Arn up and brag about it and kind of gloat. Let's hear Arn a li- just a little bit from Arn because that's who the audience is really going to want to hear from. Is Arn? He was the focus. He was the subject of the of the of the story, and then interrupt. Um, that would have been better for sure. But overall, it was pretty damn good. Especially when I, <laughs> I said, "Do you know what felonious assault is?" You got like a knock on the head. That was just so heelish. That was silly, just silly and fun. And then, you know, by coincidence, the audience just happened to start chanting asshole, asshole right after. Oh, me. sure. Coincidence. It was great. It was really kind of fun to watch. But yeah, I would have loved to hear more from Rick. A little bit more, not a lot more. But definitely hear from Arn and then cut Arn off. That would have been yes. better. So we just saw, if you're watching along with us, one of my favorite moments in Nitro. My God. It's Chris Jericho with his personal security, Ralphus and his Jericho-holic ninja. We got the full Goldberg entrance from the backstage area. Now we're playing the Goldberg theme song. Let's track it. Champ Goldberg. Talk about power. Talk about undefeated. What's his number, Mike? Talk about 146 and 0. I think it is. I think that may be the the little man that that Jericho used at full brawl, pretending to be Goldberg. How totally ridiculous is this? All right, so we'll cut it. What they've been promoting here was Goldberg versus Jericho. But as a reminder, Jericho has been campaigning as the cruiserweight champion or the TV champion, as it were, um, that he wants to wrestle Goldberg. And he has been this entire time championing and campaigning for a match with Goldberg and it didn't happen. And he even promoted that it was going to happen at fall brawl at the pay-per-view. Instead, he brings out a little guy, uh, much smaller than Goldberg dressed up just like Goldberg and it beats him up. Well, so now Jericho thinks he's going to do that again on nitro, but instead the real Goldberg comes out with the imposter over his shoulder. As soon as Jericho sees the real Goldberg is here. He just lays waste to a couple of the Jericho security guards. This is fantastic stuff. I love this era of Jericho and I know it, it it bled over and these guys did not get along in real life. As I understand it, this was all Jericho's idea and he felt like he had some momentum with his character. I would agree. This is my favorite era of Jericho and Goldberg allegedly just didn't think he was on his level and would not agree to a match that led to some harsh words and a backstage scuffle. What do you remember about the bill Goldberg, Chris Jericho 
uh what's the what's the what's the yiddish words you say mishigosh or something like that i'm gonna learn yeah crazy yeah, yeah. so what, what crazy. do you remember about that it's all true this you know jericho this was jericho's idea so much of what jericho was doing during this period of time was really jericho's idea it was his creative from ralphus and and all, all of the things that Jericho did that we remember were Jericho's ideas. This was not really created for him, certainly not by me. And, and I doubt that Kevin Sullivan had a lot to do with it. Um, that's not taking anything away from me or Kevin Sullivan, but Chris was really, really, he was emerging as a very, very creative guy with a good instinct, great instinct. It's also probably what led to Chris leaving WCW. Yeah, I would agree. I think he wrote about that in his book. Yeah. So this, this creative story and, and Chris's input and, and pushing and what we saw there, which was highly freaking entertaining. Um, but Bill just, for whatever reason, don't really know. Have a couple guesses, but um, Bill just wouldn't do it. And it's really unfortunate because I think Chris could have made Bill. I think Chris could have given an added dimension to Bill. Again, we're going to go back to chemistry, right? Red Hart, Hulk Hogan, uh, CM Punk, Elite, same thing. What could have been if everybody would have just checked their egos at the door and thought about the opportunity itself and what the opportunity could do long-term for everybody themselves and, and, and each other and the company, the fans could have been a freaking awesome. And who knows, Chris may have stuck around WCW better for him that he didn't, by the way, all truth be known, but, um, this was the catalyst for Chris, Chris deciding to write me a goodbye letter and, and, and take his talents elsewhere. As hard as I tried to keep Chris, cause I did, I offered him quite a bit to stay, but he was determined to go. And I think he was right. Chris made a wise decision, a great career move. I, uh, I can't help but ask when you said, I got a couple ideas. What are the ideas you have about how Goldberg and Jericho got off on the wrong foot? Jericho doesn't take shit from anybody. Right. He doesn't, I think at his core, he's not, I don't think Chris wants to fight anybody or is a fighter by choice but doesn't mean he's not good at it. And I think Bill disrespected Chris. Well, I know he did. And Chris wasn't going to tolerate that. I think the reason Bill disrespected Chris, and this is going to come out so fucking wrong. It's going to come out right the way I mean it, but it's going to be heard differently by different people, and probably certainly by Bill himself. Just have add another guy to the list I used to work with that's pissed off at me. But I gotta call it like I feel it. I think Bill was intimidated by Chris. Not in a physical count, not in a real fight necessarily. Yeah. But I think Chris was so good and was so had so much depth not only as a performer, what he could do technically to ring. I mean, he was really, really gifted at an early age, but I think Bill was intimidated by that. And Bill's way of dealing with being intimidated is to go into Bill Goldberg mode and shut it all down. That's what happened. It's just lack of respect and insecurity on Bill's part. And I say insecurity, I mean, as a performer, because let's face it, Bill was still really new at this point. It's not like Bill had been in the business for five or six or eight years at this point, like Chris had. Bill was still learning every single minute from the minute he walked into the building to the minute he went home. He was in a learning mode. And he compensated for that because he was Bill. And he was intimidating and he could be, but at his core, I think at this stage of his career, he was insecure with what he, he was aware of what he didn't know and what he wasn't capable of and didn't want to compromise that because it might expose him. I don't sound like a shrink, but that's 
that's my honest feeling. Chris was a great guy, he is a great guy to this day. Um, and so is Bill. But that doesn't mean that there weren't insecurities at this point in Bill's career. And, I, and, and again, not because Bill had any doubt in his physical ability or his ability as a man, but because he knew he was limited in the ring and he wanted to get And Chris wanted to have a match with him and a program with him, which would have required that Bill adapt his style and work differently in order to work with a guy like Chris and make it work and make it make sense. And I don't think Bill was ready for that consciously or sub, maybe, maybe it was subconsciously. That's what I think happened. Let's listen to Scott Hall here. Is it less feeling? <laughs> this is drunk Scott Hall. I think I need to uh, repeat, and I'm going to continue as, a, as a, a part of World Championship Wrestling as a member of this broadcast crew, repeat the same statement that I think bears repeating over and over. We are saddened at his state. We do not condone his actions nor his condition coming into the ring. We hope the man will get help very soon. On the other side of the coin, here's a man that needs no help. A man who's become his own man, who's become quite a champion, I must say. Kidman makes his way to the ring. This should be a good matchup. The WCW reigning World Cruiserweight Champion. A man we'll who it right has there. made so much success. We're doing the, uh, the, the silly, drunk Scott Hall storyline. You've talked about this before, but not everybody listens to every single episode in hindsight. What do you think about that presentation? I'm very disappointed in myself. I just wish I could take that one back. Yeah. Don't know what else to say. It's really kind of disgusting to be honest. I didn't obviously feel that way at the time. I guess I was trying to figure things out and make the best. I, what do they say? Make chicken salad out of chicken shit. But boy, did I feel miserably on that one. And I just, I feel, I just feel bad. We, uh, we should remind everybody that he's wrestling Billy Kidman, who is the cruiserweight champion. As you heard Mike today lay out there and this whole booking got some criticism. They're going to do a six minutes and 13 second match here. And Scott Hall gets the win and Meltzer would be critical of this decision to put Scott Hall against Billy Kidman. So let's just table the, uh, the drunk stuff for a minute. Meltzer says they have a hundred guys on the roster who don't mean crap that can put Hall over. So they choose to cut the legs off another young guy who was getting over not to mention made it basically non-competitive and pretty much destroyed not only their cruiserweight champ, but the entire division by the portrayal of this match. When a guy starts getting hot in the WWF, they keep pushing him until he starts cooling off. And if it means upsetting an established star, so be it. In WCW, when a guy starts getting hot, they immediately have an established star squash him unless the company got the guy as hot as opposed to one of those guys who just catches on for no apparent reason. Unless as some people think this is all just a prelude of Kidman beating Hall and they're doing the original one, two, three kid gimmick. Uh, listen, I understand what Meltzer saying. He's probably a little heavy handed. We have seen some of this type booking in WWE in more recent years. It feels like there's a lot of momentum and the fans are with it. And then we cut him off. Yeah. How about, not- how about Dave Meltzer's book of the year? Tony Khan who's probably made a habit out of doing that over the last couple of years. Well, but thankfully, it's just, not- it, it, it's just Dave Meltzer. I'm sorry, Conrad. I'm sorry. The, the, they're not doing that now with guys like LA Knight. They're at least letting the momentum continue to build. And I'm happy for that. But a few years ago, man, that Rusev day thing that got over, they sold out the shirts and then they just quit doing anything with him. So I'm just saying in this era, when we're saying, Hey, the WWF, they never do this. Well, they do now, but I understand this point. If we're going to do essentially a squash match, why not have Scott Hall do a squash match? No disrespect to the, the Nick Dinsmore's or the Lenny Lane type characters on the program, not necessarily someone who's supposed to be the best of a division. You have to agree that in hindsight, maybe you could have got somebody else to take Kidman's spot for this, right? Sure. You could have, but there's also, and I'm not, I'm not defending this. Trust me. When I say this, I, I actually feel really bad about this, but not for the same reason as Dave Meltzer would have pointed out. I'm not going to argue that there could have been a better selection for this particular match for Scott, but 
bear with me. There's also an argument to be said for if you want somebody to get heat, you beat and abuse somebody that the audience loves as opposed to a warm body with a pulse that just came out to be a, a whipping boy. So there, there is some argument to be made that having Scott come out here and do this to a guy who's just beginning to get his feet underneath him and get some momentum and has the support of the audience on some levels makes sense compared to just a squash match because just a squash match wouldn't have got, wouldn't have done anything for Scott beating somebody that's getting some momentum actually does at some level, not to justify this match, but there was a reason. It wasn't a good reason, but there was a reason. By the way, I also Virgil, saw Virgil. I want to just shift gears for a second because mostly I feel shitty about myself right now and I need to. But last weekend, I was in Hamburg, Pennsylvania, about an hour and a half outside of Philadelphia, doing a, 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 a small wrestling convention. Saw a lot of people there. So Ron, Ron Simmons, got to hang out with him and D'Lo Brown and Godfather and saw a lot of other people. X Pac was there. It was great. It's always great to see people you haven't seen in a long time. But the coolest part of it was, and one of the reasons I get a kick out of doing some of these events, is I was in the Hamburg Field House, which was built around 1960 or 61, I think. And the guy, the promoter came over to me as I'm sitting there and I'm signing the autographs. And there was a ring set up in the middle of the field house because later that night they were going to have wrestling matches. And he came over and started telling me the history of the building, which I always dig. I always like thinking about, you know, if these walls could talk, you know, what have they seen? Who, who performed here? And the promoter proceeded to tell me, and it was such a historic building in so many ways. Vince senior ran the building and told me about the Piper's pit, you know, coconut scene that took place back in the corner. And then he pointed up to the lighting grid over the ring. And he said, Vince Sr. paid for that lighting rig. That was the same lighting rig that Vince Sr. used to use when they did TV tapings in the Hamburg house. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about here, but it's kind of like the history and the legacy. And every once in a while, you get an opportunity to be in a building and you get just a little sniff of what things might have been like back in that day. But, man, how far has wrestling come since then? Yeah. We, uh, man, oh, man. It's interesting to look back at this and just see how much wrestling has changed or maybe how much of it is the same. Um, I, 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 for one really thought Scott Hall was one of the more underrated performers of all time. And, and his demons have been discussed ad nauseum forever, but his impact on wrestling will just never be forgotten. And you and I, when we did a tribute show in his regard, Man, we said he's probably, when you think about cool, whatever that means, those words, you know, those letters touching cool, Scott Hall's probably the epitome of that. Is he not? Sure was. And you go all the way back, you know, I was going through social media a couple of days ago and, you know, somebody sent me a photo of Kurt Hennig and Scott Hall back in the AWA. He was cool back then. I think he came out of the shoot cool. I don't know if there was ever a time in Scott Hall's life where he wasn't kind of, and it was not like he was always trying to be. He just was. He just had such an instinct and look in the way he carried himself. And it's really unfortunate. Obviously, it's unfortunate. It cost him his life. But the demons that got a hold, you know, that were a hold of Scott as we we're watching him here and, and prior. I mean, this wasn't new. The situation that Scott was in here was something that had been building up and developing for a long, long time. Wow. Hey, we're making fun of it. Um, had that not been the case, had Scott not had the demons he had, I'm not even going to go into why he had them because I understand it. People that know Scott's story and his history and some of the things that happened in Scott's life before professional wrestling know what I'm talking about. But had that not happened, Scott Hall was not only cool as shit 
not only did he have an amazing instinct beyond his knowledge, he had instinct and, and understood what worked and how to create that emotion and how to get over and his timing. Everything about Scott was almost perfect when he was in his right mind, but his creative instincts and what he could do and could have done what he did for Sting, Steve Borden with the Crow character. That was Scott Hall. That wasn't Eric Bischoff. That wasn't Steve Borden. That wasn't Kevin Sullivan. That wasn't anybody. That was Scott Hall that created that character. And he did it effortlessly. If Scott would have, Scott would have been able to manage his demons. His, he, he would still be here today having a major influence on the product that we're seeing today, whether it's an AEW or WWE or anywhere else. Because he was one of a kind, one of a kind that could not only do it, but he could teach it and he could inspire others and, and, and get people over, whether he was involved in the ring with him or not. He was, he was a magic, magic guy. We've got uh, Alex Wright out here strutting that ass, taking on Davey Boy Smith. Uh, Meltzer would say, I won't say this was Smith's first good match in WCW because that's going too far, but this is the best he's looked. And he did two good moves, one of which was his upside down surfboard, and the crowd popped big for. There was a ref bump, and a second ref came in, right back suplex Smith, and both guys got a shoulder up at two, but each ref blew the call. So we see Davey Boy here, and Unfortunately, he's not maybe in the best space personally at this time. We know, sadly, uh, he's not long for this world in this era, but what a incredibly talented performer. And I know you and I both thought Alex, Wright, Man, he could have been a much, much bigger star, but this finish here with the referee screw job thing, we've recently seen on TV where there were moments like this, where maybe they, the referees were to bear a little bit of blame what's the protocol or what should be protocol uh, as far as responsibility of the referee in, in the case of a, uh, a snafu well first of all the referee should have a should be mic'd or should have a an earbud so your director should be talking to your referee so that in case of a botch and you're probably referring to what happened with john moxley uh, a week or so ago that was horrible horrible situation doubled down horrible on the fact that he was dropped on his head, not just once, which was bad enough and knocked him out, but twice because the ref didn't know how to call the finish. The ref didn't know what to do. It wasn't an inexperienced ref. I'm guessing. I don't know him I'm not being critical of him. It was a bizarre situation, I guess, but the fact that there wasn't a director in his ear telling him exactly what to do, so that the talent, so that the ref could guide the talent through it. That's the botch. Communication was the botch. Fit, you know, obviously, the move was botched, and the, the the pile driver, which is so fucking dangerous anyway. I hate seeing it. It's not even impressive anymore because people do it so often. It's the least impressive finishing move out there, in my opinion. It's not dynamic. It doesn't look particularly awesome. And it's been so overdone, it's almost meaningless. Add to that, it's fucking dangerous. And now you've got an inexperienced referee on top of it. And what appears to be, I'm not there, I wasn't there, but I'm guessing there was no communication between the ref and the truck. Or if it was, something went wrong. Now, and I don't want to say what should have been done. I wasn't there. In the, in the heat of the moment, that, that whole sequence of events and the ref going down and doing a two count when it was clearly a three count, you had a tight camera shot on top of it. So the audience watching at home just went, what the hell? It just exacerbated everything. But I don't know. I, I it is ultimately the referee's responsibility, not the director's. But the fact that there was likely no communication between the director and an inexperienced referee compounded the issue. 
I don't know how the ref didn't see that Moxley was down when he didn't get his shoulder up. It was clearly hurt. Easy for me to say, because I wasn't in the moment and it's 2020 hindsight, all that. I get it. I'm guilty of it. I'm human too. But I can't imagine how a referee could see, clearly see that the guy's unconscious and didn't do what he was supposed to do and call a three count anyway. It's like, what the fuck? Maybe that referee shouldn't have been refereeing that match. I don't know. I don't want to be too hard because I, I wasn't there. I, I don't know all of the circumstances. All I know is what I saw. It's a tough spot. Being a referee, by the way, now that I've said all that, can be one of the more difficult jobs in that ring. Yeah. You're, you're not only calling the action, you're performing as you should perform based on the action that's happening inside of the ring, but you're also, well, most of the time, you're also listening to the truck. You're conveying time. You're, you're reminding the talent of how much time they have left or when to go home or when to buy more time. If for whatever reason, the director decides we need more time in this match, all of those things happen and they're all happening in real time while you're performing. You talk about spinning plates. So I know I was just, I was hard on that referee in that particular match, but I also want to suggest to the audience that being a referee can be one of the more difficult jobs in that ring. It's one of the, the third man in the ring is a real thing. You know, it's more than just the two performers there. And we're fortunate and lucky enough over on 83 weeks to hear from two of those more iconic third men in the ring. Uh, we've got Nick Patrick representing the WCW side of things and Mike Kyoto representing the WWE side of things. And they alternate weeks on what we call uh, Monday mailbag. We do that format because we think, man, these guys have been in there for so many matches and moments. Uh, we want you guys to be able to pick their brain. So if you haven't checked that content out, go out of your way to do it. Uh, so here comes our second referee, Mr. Charles Robinson. Let's try to track this and see what the announcers try to make of this finish here. Love helps going to come or not. He's got a pick up and a good reach over the top. One, two. No, no, no he got the sh did he get the shoulder up? Wait, wait, wait here. We had two referees count. Uh-uh, that won't fly. Both wrestlers had their shoulders down on the mat. This is kind of cool. And an argument's going on. Yeah. I really think that uh, Billy Silverman, the referee aside, is the one that presides over this. Well, who's ever in charge of the match? And he raised the hand. Is he ringing the bell because the match is over, or is he going to start the match again? we got two referees. First time I like this. Maps. This fight's going on. This match is over. The bell sounded to, to get the combatants out of the ring. Well, they got to get together and talk this out and come up with a decision here. Uh, the, the, the argument goes on, and uh, Mike, you're right to say that both wrestlers had their shoulders down, but Silverman saw, as what we saw, the shoulder coming up. Brain will let you talk through this one again to show the fans exactly what we're talking about. Good job with the Shakespeare by the referees there, too many audience in on the conversation. Right hit the referee. Bulldog is unaware of it. But then Alex comes up from behind, suplexes him. One, and they're both counting. Two. See, now Bulldog gets his shoulders up. Silverman sees it. The other referee does not see it. Yeah, but did Alex Wright get his shoulder up? Well, let's see. Listen, I know that this yes. is lost on a lot of people here, but I really like the idea that we're trying to uh, create a little bit of real sports controversy. In football, they have these type of debates all the time. He was I was, in, yeah, I was thinking he the was same out. thing as you said. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. And this was done, I mean, I've seen similar angles play out and not be done very well. Like the audience would just groan. But this one was done really, really well. And there's nothing wrong with a match like this that leads to a rematch or some other, you know, evolution of the story, nothing wrong with it when it's done really, really well. You just don't want to do that type of thing too often. Nitro parties were such a big deal of the program. And, uh, well, a big deal of our program is, uh, the nitro girls. And when I see the nitro girls, I can't help, but think about one of our sponsors, maybe our favorite sponsor, certainly our <laughs> longest sponsor blue chew. They deliver the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. Take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. 
The process is simple. You'll sign up at bluechew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Bluetooth tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. Bluetooth wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluetooth.com. Chew it and do it. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Bluetooth free. When you use our promo code 83 weeks at checkout, just pay $5 shipping. That's bluetooth.com. The promo code 83 weeks to receive your first month free. Visit bluetooth.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Bluetooth for sponsoring today's podcast. Let's get back to Nitro here. The uh, Nitro girls are doing their thing, and uh, we're uh, rocking and rolling here on September 28th, 1998. In three, two, one, play. As I understand it, we've still got uh, a couple little squash matches still to come. Uh, we've got Kevin Nash and Brian Adams, uh, and we've got uh, Lex Luger and Conan taking on uh, Darso and Hugh Morris. And then our main event is going to be here. But what a tag team that is Darso and Hugh Morris. Barry Darso, Robbinsdale, Minnesota. went to high school with my wife. You believe that actually Barry Darso used to date my wife's best friend. What a small world. It is indeed a small world. And Barry's son is now a canine officer. I think either in Michigan or Wisconsin, he uh, trains. He, he actually worked in uh, TNA for just a little bit. I got him a gig there for a while. I lost you guys there for a second. We're still here with you and we're glad that you guys are tuning in to 83 weeks. We've got a lot of different questions that we should get to. Uh, Dylan Leahy wants to know whether any ECW talents that Eric had his eye on during this time, or at least were on his radar guys like Rob Van Dam, Jerry Lynn, Tommy dreamer. None. Um, I think I had worked with Jerry Lynn in WCW on and off prior to ECW. Uh, so I was certainly aware of him. Jerry's from Minneapolis, I believe was exposed to him there. Um, but no, I mean, Kevin Sullivan had his eye on, on ECW and, and I think Terry Taylor did as well. So any of the talent that was of interest by WCW at that time was of interest because of Kevin's Kevin Sullivan's familiarity with them or, and or Terry Taylor's. I, re, I really, and I'm not saying this to take a shot at anybody. I just wasn't watching it at all. Like, I don't think I watched five minutes of ECW when it was on television throughout their entire run. Uh, but Kevin did and Terry did. So for me, no, not, not personally. We got a promo here for uh, Halloween havoc. Uh, you've set the record straight. So many of us have believed for so long that Starcade was the WrestleMania for WCW. Uh, you would contend it was actually Halloween havoc. And just based on the vibe in the feel at times, that's hard to argue. But we do have a question about Starcade from Jeffrey. He wants to know, was there ever any thought to building to a sting Bret Hart match at Starcade 98 instead of a feud ending at Halloween havoc, or was it always going to end at Halloween havoc because sting needed to take a leave of absence? There was, you know, circumstances aside, cause I don't remember all of them. Um, but it was never contemplated a sting Bret Hart match. Not that it wouldn't have been a good idea, by the way, not that it wouldn't have become contemplated at some point, but it wasn't on the table in any of our initial thoughts or discussions. Um, you know, we should at least talk about, uh, you know, some of the news and notes about the, the ratings here and remind everybody that this is September. So your competition is more than just Monday night raw in late September. What's everybody paying attention to on Monday nights, Eric football. Come on now. Uh, yeah. Monday night football is, uh, is back and, uh, it did an 11.1 rating for the lions versus the bucks, which was head to head here. That's the second lowest in the 29 year history of the show. Uh, but you also had something else going on. San Francisco taking on the Cubs on ESPN, WGN, and KTVU. That does an 8.1 rating on ESPN, a 9.3 rating overall uh, in the cable universe, and a 7.6 in the entire broadcast universe. Now, you might be saying to yourself, self, why is everybody watching that? 
We're winding down the regular season and Sammy Sosa is chasing Roger Maris's record. So you've got Monday night football an all-time baseball record on the line. And Oh, by the way, Monday night raw, this is some pretty damn stiff competition. Raw does a 4.67 rating and a 6.9 share. Nitro does a 3.99 rating and a 5.8 share. If you combine wrestling together, it's 8.54 in the cable universe, AKA just slightly behind baseball. This that's is amazing. A, yes. I mean, that's, and, and today you hear dirt sheet writers, peripheral experts justifying a low rating because little league baseball was on TV. <laughs> I mean, it's a, a woman's volleyball. You know, it's like, come on. It, it tells you where, and people can say all they want about how people watch TV and streaming and, you know, more people are watching now than ever before. And you, you can, you know, join into that circle jerk if you choose to. But the truth is professional wrestling was at the, I don't want to say the apex of pop culture at that time, but if you look at the combined number of WCW and WWE against Monday night football and against baseball, particularly that, that, that game, amazing, amazing numbers, amazing numbers. Let's do uh, a couple more questions here. Uh, before we do, I guess we should mention that, uh, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about in the demo. Well, in the demos and the head to head hours, nitro maintained a slight edge of males, 25, 54 and 55 plus, but got routed 426 to 255 among males, 18 to 24, which was an age group that nitro used to own raw, which generally trails greatly among women also won women, 25, 54. And even 1824 handily, an age group WCW usually more than doubles WWF in. Mm -hmm. So the women is a piece of the story we've never really talked about. We hear so much about men 25, 54. That's the demo, blah, blah, blah. Um, but we've also heard that more women watch WWE than watch AEW. And I would imagine that here, normally, Nitro would see more women watching it rather than some of the stuff they were doing on WWE. Was that ever a priority? I know that when I interviewed Jim Hurd several years ago, he wanted to get the kids for the licensing and the merch and the action figures and all that sort of stuff. But was women, do you remember that ever being an initiative for WCW? No, nope. And that was, that is, I should say still is one of the things that WWE has done so well. And I think a lot of that credit goes to Stephanie McMahon. Because during this period of time, as you're kind of breaking down the demos, especially the 18 to 24 year old males, well, guess why they were watching because of the way women were utilized in a very provocative, very sexual, overtly so manner. Of course, you're going to get 18 to 24 year olds. My God, I was one once. I know how that shit works. It's pretty simple. Sex has always sold, particularly in that demo, right? And that's what WWE was doing back then. It wasn't until much later that WWE, as I pointed out, in my opinion, at least, thanks to Stephanie McMahon, um, started positioning women much differently and, and building their women's audience as a result of it and making women competitive and developing them and creating characters like Charlotte Flair and bringing in, you know, credible female athletes like Ronda Rousey and so many others. I could name a bunch of them to this moment. Look at where Becky Lynch is today as a performer compared to what Sable did not to pick on Sable. She was doing what a lot of other women did in WWE at the time. But there's a big difference there. And I think one of the reasons WWE has such a strong women's component today is because of the commitment they made to develop that female talent base. WCW never did that. There wasn't enough women around at that time. There was a small handful domestically. And the mm -hmm. women that existed internationally, we brought them over as often as we could. Old Nakano and Medusa as an example. But it wasn't like there was a roster full of women you know, over in Japan that we could bring over on a regular basis. And there weren't very many women in the United States 
that were pursuing a career in professional wrestling. And, and many of them who were really weren't ready for TV. So there's such a limited talent pool at that time. And it wasn't a priority, a mistake, I might add, lack of foresight, I might add. But nonetheless, there wasn't a, a, a commitment to let's develop women. Let's start bringing some, let's go out and scout some women and bring them in and train them to be pros and to develop characters and to present their athletic abilities in the ring. That did not exist. Not proud of it, but it just. <laughs> I mean, but let, let me ask this. I, I don't know the answer. So I'm, I'm legit asking. There was such a, a void of women's wrestling on TV for so long. Like it was a real rarity to see women wrestling on TV in the eighties. When I first started watching, I can't imagine there was much more in the seventies or sixties. Like it grew as time went on, but yet women were still watching wrestling. Eventually I do think the worm turned, so to speak. I mean, you could take a look at the crowd of say a JCP crowd back in the day. And I'm not going to say it was 50, 50, but there were a lot more women than there would be at a show today. And I think you see, you know, more families and more women at a WWE show than you do at an AEW show because you're maybe catering to more of the hardcore fans. I get that, but I am just really legitimately curious. Do you believe one of the keys to success to getting women to watch the show is to have women perform female performers? I ask because when we examine stuff from the impact or the TNA era, the segments that did the best were the women segments, the knockouts. But I don't think that the ladies really wanted to see the scantily clad bra and panty matches as much as the guys. So I'm wondering, is the inverse of that potentially also true? Those ladies back in the eighties, they were showing up to JCP because they wanted to see Ric Flair and they wanted to see Carrie Von Eric. And they wanted to see like, that feels logical to me that guys are going to want to watch the ladies matches and girls are going to want to match the guys matches. Am I off base there? Or do you think we well, need no, I, it's human nature, right? I mean, there's, there, <laughs> there are pheromones floating throughout the, the arena and some of them are attractive to, to, to males and others are attractive to females. It's kind of human nature, but I think, you, you know, I think what happens is when a product gets hot, when, when, when you've got, whether it's WWE or even WCW, I was going to comment earlier on a couple of the crowd chats um, there were some pretty attractive women that started showing up, you know, to, to nitro events because nitro became an event. It became a party and it was a lot more fun for women to go and hang out and watch a bunch of guys beating on each other, big athletic, you know, good looking, you know, talented most of some of the time, I should say, um, often. Um, but it was more like a party and it was the same might've been true. I wasn't there. Um, in, in the JCP days, because when it was hot, yeah, if you're a female and your boyfriend or significant other says, Hey, let's go to a wrestling match. It was a lot easier to do when the product was hot and cool and fun and felt more like a party. Um, I think you're right. You know, in the sixties, the seventies, the eighties, when I was a wrestling fan before I got into the wrestling business, even after I got into the wrestling business, you know, Wendy Richter was a, we see her often, not regularly, not every week, but Wendy Richter and, and some of the women that she worked with, who I can't recall, but I do recall Wendy Richter. She was a very athletic, way ahead of her time, actually. I think, you know, in, in terms of being a real trailblazer, which everybody likes to use, I, you know, I go back and look at early 80s Wendy Richter because she wasn't just out there, TNA not the wrestling version, the tits and ass version. She wasn't out there just as eye candy. She was out there performing and did so very, very well. Um, but there was so few of them. So I, I think the key to getting women a, to grow the women's audience lies primarily in building the Charlotte Flairs and the Becky Lynches and the Ronda Rouseys and, 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 and so many more of the, high, the Britt Bakers, you know, people that are out there that are performing that are attractive, but they're also very athletic. That's aspirational, you know, and that's what I think makes wrestling work at the most fundamental of all psychology 
is you're living vicariously through your through the characters you see on television. Yes, you go there for the sex appeal and just the inherent human attraction. Um, but I think beyond that, more than that, it's the aspirational nature of wrestling. The larger than life characters, the there for the grace of God go I, you know, potential in what you're seeing in front of you. And I think as WWE has done and AEW is, is continuing to do, you're seeing more and more athletic women that other women can relate to. It makes them feel okay about going to a wrestling event. They're not just going to a testicle festival. They're going to an event where they see characters in the ring that in their minds, again, there for the grace of God go I. And sometimes those aspirational characters become inspirational characters and inspire women. Did you say, look at that, right? See, see what I said? See what I just said? Right there, as you're watching, if you're not watching, there's a very attractive young 20-something-year-old blonde at ringside having a blast. But, yeah, I think the combination of aspirational, inspirational characters for women is one of the reasons why the WWE has been so successful in that area. I wanted to bring up a couple more news and notes before we get ready for our main event here. Um, Meltzer would write, the big, t- biggest topic of conversation over the past week in wrestling was the Bret Hart Wrestling with Shadows movie as copies of preliminary tapes have gotten around. Had you seen it by this point, or when did you see Wrestling with Shadows, and what did you think? I've never seen it. I've never sat down and watched it. I've seen a clip or two of it. We got to watch it for ad-free shows one day. I think. Yeah, let's do that because I've never. I I, I know it was a hot topic and it was controversial at the time, and I vaguely remember the development of it and things like that. But uh, I know I've never never watched it. There's going to be a miscommunication at the end of the show, but you know it's going to be a big finish when we see Michael Buffer here. We've talked a lot about what he added. Um. Didn't we just we see should, him on Monday Night Football recently? We did. Yeah, there you go. We should mention uh, this is up against the Raw where they have the infamous Zamboni angle where Austin drives it down to the ring to attack Vince McMahon. There's a main event of Ken Shamrock, Mankind, and The Rock taking on Kane and The Undertaker in a handicap match. And there's some news and notes before we get to the actual in-ring match here I want to bring up. While this is not confirmed, this does come from people very close to the situation, and it's that the Giant is either very close to or has completed a deal to go to the WWF. He's been talking loudly about it for weeks, and some think he's doing that as a move, as a way to get Bischoff's attention and make sure the rumor gets started. He worked all the weekend house shows after missing Utica on November, or I'm sorry, September 23rd, complaining of a broken rib, although his action was kept to a minimum. The rumor largely stems from these three things, his talk of a claimed $1 million per year offer and several recent threats to take it, which is quite a bit more than what he earns in WCW coming from the WWF, the validity of which is speculative. Although knowing what what Vince McMahon likes and knowledge they've wanted him from the start, the giant fits the bill given his age 27 and his huge size. But Giant no-showing Nitro on September 28th and the talk from his friends in recent days saying that he's going or is already gone, not to mention that his career has been stagnant for quite a while. When did you know that the real-life Paul White was frustrated with his spot in WCW? And what were the overall issues with him? When did you know he was making overtures about wanting to go to the WWF? What can you tell us about that? He told me right off the bat. He told me he was going to have a conversation with Vince. Told him I would too if I were you. Yeah. He told me that he had a million dollar a year guarantee and I congratulated him. I mean, I I had done, I had worked with Paul, and this is I like Paul. I liked him. I still like him. He is a good guy. Yes. He really is a good guy. But on the creative side, I had a hard time figuring out what to do with Paul. Mm -hmm. You can't go out there and have him meet everybody because there's no one left for him to work with. You can't get sympathy on a guy that's seven foot tall and 400 pounds or whatever he was. That's right. It's just creatively very, very difficult. And I knew I couldn't fix that. So as much as I liked Paul, I didn't want the perception of somebody leaving my company and going to the competition, that's always a little bit of a sting. It doesn't draw blood, but it stings. I, I, I didn't want it to happen, 
but I didn't lift a finger to prevent it either. I encouraged, I didn't want to say encouraged it, but I, I supported it. There was no secret. There was no gamesmanship. Paul wasn't trying to spread rumors. It wasn't any of that Dave Meltzer horse shit that he lives off of. It was a very simple decision on Paul's part. It was support on my part. There was no way I was going to try to match up million dollars a year for Paul White, which was a guy that we couldn't figure out anything really consistently to do. We could use him as an attraction, but you can't justify a million dollars a year downside guarantee. And that's what Paul's offer was. It was a million million dollars a year downside guarantee. There's no way I was going to even attempt to match that. There's no way I'd get my money back out of it. I knew that. I'd worked with him for a couple of years at that point. So here we go, man. Bret Hart, Hulk Hogan, hooking it up here. We waited so long for it to happen, and it's finally happening. Well, I would. I'd love to talk to Charles Robinson and 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 get his per, perception or perspective as the referee in this match to hear what these guys are talking about, how they were calling it, what went on in the ring between those two guys that we couldn't hear or didn't see. Hogan's working here. You know, you can say what you want about Hulk Hogan or, or his relationship with Brett, but this is a different Hulk Hogan than you would have seen in, in any other match. He's Hulk is trying to up his game here to, to complement or showcase Brett's style of wrestling. Yes, he is. You know, spinning around into a front face lock, you know, standing switch into a reversal and, you didn't see Hulk do that with anybody. You, you'd else. see that kind of stuff in, out of Hulk Hogan in Japan, but not too often in the United States. No doubt. What's um, with the benefit of hindsight? Do you think there's anything you could have done to put these guys' minds at ease and make them want to do business to each other, make them trust each other? No, because it's not that I didn't try. Right. You know, but Hulk, Hulk can be, especially back then, once he made up his mind about certain things, I mean, he was very malleable. He'd cooperate in a lot of, you know, he tried different things. He was open-minded in a lot of different ways until it came to trust. When it came to trust, he became very, very rigid. And if he had a reason not to trust you, whether it was real or imagined, it was almost impossible to get him off of it. And I think the same was true with Brett. That's why it was so hard. It's, um, it's a story as long as the day is long, you know, guys just not getting along and it's not unique to wrestling. Um, Let's do a question here from Justin. He wants to know there's a number of Hulk's close friends, such as Brutus that you didn't really have a high opinion of. How did you approach this with Hulk? Did you pick your battles Did Hulk know your opinion of them? Um, yes, he knew. He knew I didn't want to showcase some of that talent any more than necessary. In certain cases, you know, some of the, you know, the nasty boys in, in WCW w was added value. Nasty boys, you know, you say what you want about them and they work great and all the other dirt sheet bullshit, but they were entertaining as hell and the crowd enjoyed them. You know, Hacksaw Jim Duggan came along and was Hacksaw at the peak of his career or was he, did he have a gimmick that was dated? Yes, he did. Did he, was he at the peak of his career? No, he wasn't. Did the crowd still really like seeing Hacksaw Jim Duggan? Go back and watch the tape. Yeah. The crowd loved seeing him. It was a little bit of a, a wink and a nod. I don't want to call it a nostalgia act. It wasn't quite nostalgia at that point, but it was certainly a wink and a nod to an earlier era. But the crowd loved it. And as we talked about with the Dusty Rhodes Wrestling Buffet analogy, you need some of that. You, you just do. But there was certain talent that I think – took away from Hulk and Brutus was one of them to this day. I think 
Hulk would have been better off and more powerful as a character had he not wanted, demanded in some respects, to share the limelight with certain people, like Brutus, to a degree, Jimmy Hart. You know, it, it, Hulk didn't need it. He, he just didn't need it, but he felt more comfortable in that respect. So you go along with it. But Hulk knew how I felt. I, yeah, I, I didn't. I didn't beat anybody up and berate him. And when I say beat him up, I mean verbally, obviously. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't bury anybody and, and and petition not to have people on television. I did try to minimize it as best I could because, it, especially in Jimmy Hart's case, and I love Jimmy. Jimmy's a great guy, and he's he's he works so hard. He adds so much value in so many different ways, or did back then. But he had a tendency to want to be on TV too much. He had the, he, and he was right, man. I saw Jimmy in Hamburg. He was at a table, two tables away from me, 79 years old with a line of people wanting to get his autograph because he spent so much time on television. So he wasn't wrong for him, but sometimes you need to look at what's best for the talent. And in Jimmy's case, he was out on the show. There's been times I've seen as you and I have gone through shows, uh, you'd see Jimmy come out three, four five times on the show. Yes. I mean, mm, that's too much. That's overkill. But it was that Memphis mentality and it worked for Jimmy, but I think it actually took away sometimes from Hulk and some of the other characters. Take a listen. Sting is in the ring. I like this. This feels right. He's waited for this moment his entire career. Yeah, but you can't feel the audio here. What's happened is they've done this too early. Meltzer would say that it all started with Hogan dropping Hart's knee on the guardrail twice, wrapping it around the post, and continuing to work on it until Sting showed up. And then Luger and Conan drag Hart away and tie him on a stretcher where the ambulance is ready. Scott Steiner and Bagwell jump Conan and Luger. Hart gets off the stretcher and limp backs limps back. Sting was beating on Hogan and had him in the scorpion. When Hart cheering sting on gives sting a DDT and destroys him and Hogan and Hart laugh together at the end. Luger and Conan came out for the save for the save, but it just got weird and fell apart at this point. The lights went out and warrior was supposed to do a run in to save Luger and Conan except they never got in the ring to begin with due to a massive communication and the show just went off the air three minutes early without warrior ever doing anything. Nitro was a mess by the end of the show as it went off three minutes early before the hour because Hogan sting and Hart ended their angle way too early. They actually sent Conan and Luger back out to try and stall to keep action going. Meanwhile, raw had nine unopposed minutes going off the air at 11 6 PM. Man, you, you did a great job setting it up in, in one of the opening segments. It's going to be Hogan versus Brett. First time ever. We continue that thread throughout the show on the commentary. And then when it comes time to do it, yeah, we got a couple minutes of it. But now here comes Sting and here comes Luger and here comes Conan. It just becomes, frankly, an overbooked mess. You know what it becomes? A perfect example of WCW disease. Hmm. Never this was not a complicated finish. This could have been an easy story to tell, but it was way overbooked, way more complicated than it needed to be. Too many moving pieces, way too freaking complicated for a live show. And it, it just wasn't necessary. To tell the story we wanted to tell, it absolutely was not necessary to overcomplicate this finish. St it just still pisses me off to this day. This is what we sucked at. We did say everything so great in so many respects, especially during, you know, 96, 97, 98, even well, early into 98, mid 98, but it's just the overbooking and the lack of clean. And when I say clean, I don't necessarily mean a clean one, two, three finish, but a cl clean finish in the sense that it was dramatic 
it, it advanced the story. It set up what could happen going forward. That's what a great finish should do. And this was the opposite of that. It just pisses me off to this day. It's such a waste. I hate waste. I hate wasted opportunity. Here's an example of a wasted opportunity. This could have been so fucking good. And it ends up being a kaleidoscope of schmuck. It's just, ugh. It's a mess, man. And I mean, listen, don't get me wrong. It tickles me to see Scott Steiner and Buff Bagwell climb out of the back of the ambulance wearing all white. And the crowd's really going nuts here. Let's track the finish. Sting is putting the scorpion on Hogan. Oh. Is he ever Hogan on his days? All right, so we can cut the audio. It's hard to make sense of this. I mean, you know, because it doesn't make any. That's yeah. why it's so hard. Uh, why would these guys come out here and wrestle and hurt each other and wrap their legs around the posts and pretend to do a match and then, oh no, it was really a swerve the whole time. We got a little too cute for our own good here, and this is not Vince Russo's fault. No. I know a lot of times when people would talk about the swerve, bro, they always just say, oh, it was Russo. This one just makes no sense. And I understand that, hey, if we can't get Brett and Hogan to work against each other, let's get them to work with each other. But this is a really convoluted way to get here. And we sort of saw that in the WWF for WrestleMania 9. I didn't get that pay-per-view, but my friend did. And I remember calling and saying, hey, man, uh, I saw Bret Hart was wrestling Yokozuna for the title. Who won? Who's the champ? Hulk Hogan. No, no. He was in the tag match for the tag titles with, uh, money Inc. I'm asking about the world title with Yokozuna and Bret Hart. That was the main event of WrestleMania. Who's the champ Hulk Hogan. Well, it's sort of the same thing here. Now it feels like, you know, second verse, same as the first, Hey man, uh, what happened at the end of, uh, the, the Hulk Hogan, Bret Hart match? Well, um, sting put the scorpion death lock on Hulk Hogan. Wait, what? It doesn't make any sense. It was right there. We could have did it, but we didn't. Ultimately, we know this means they're going in the direction of instead of Hogan versus Sting again for the 9,000th time or Hogan versus Brett, which we really thought we wanted. We're going to get Brett versus Sting, which again, I still like, but we didn't need Hogan in, in the middle of this. It just feels uh, a mess. I don't know another way to say it. Bad creative. So, so it's it. And, and there's probably reasons for it. I'd like to hear Kevin Sullivan's uh, opinion of this. Um, I let it happen. So ultimately it's my responsibility, not Kevin Sullivan's, but Kevin was a part of it. I'd like to hear the real story behind it. My guess is this is the result of a multitude of compromises that ended up occurring throughout the day. This match probably started out with a pretty clear cut finish and creative and throughout the course of the day, in an effort to compromise, get everybody feeling comfortable, make everybody happy, it became a diluted clusterfuck. I, um, I, the thing that, that really challenges me the most is the timing of the show. And as I understand, sometimes people call it back timing. Who would have been in control of timing a show like this where? We're done several minutes before we go off the air. And now where we're supposed to be getting people to a fever pitch right at the end of the show, we're, we find ourselves just stalling. Uh, and I know you've said we needed a guy like Pat Patterson and we needed more infrastructure and we needed a better finish guy. And I know all that, but as far as someone wearing a headset, working on the timing saying, okay, go. And then communicating to the referee through the IFB, hey, tell them to go home. And, 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 at, at this point, it's the director. The, the show's been formatted. The show's been timed. Okay. Before we go on the air. Adjust, adjustments need to be made sometimes during the course of the show. If a match ends up early or goes a little bit too long, which is usually the case. Yes, you do have to adjust a minute here, two or three minutes there. That all happens during the course of the show. And by the way, that happens almost every live show. You're, you're, I've never been at a live show when I've been in gorilla in WWE or in that same position in WCW when I was doing it, where you weren't adjusting as you went along. It's just is what it is. 
But the show would have been timed. Everybody would have been, been, been involved from David Crockett, everybody in production. Um, Jody Hamilton probably was there helping to time. Um, but once the show was timed, laid to paper, handed over to the truck, the lights go on, the bell rings, TV's on its way. Then it's your director who's calling the shots with the referee in the ring, whoever that referee happened to be, who was taught it was telling the talent where we are in terms of time whether we needed to stretch, whether we needed to hurry things up. It's, it's your director, direct communication to your referee who is in communication to the talent to the ring. It's that simple. There's, it's, there's no more mystery to it than that. And sometimes talent was great at listening. Other times they weren't. And this is probably a case where they weren't, largely because it was freaking convoluted. Yeah, it was. Well, well, listen, get your, uh, get your coffee ready, Eric. Next week, we're going to be talking about Eddie Guerrero. Yay! In the months, we're going to be diving back into Scott Hall once again. We'll watch Halloween Havoc 1999. We'll talk about New Japan. Talk a little Ted Turner. We've only got 10 more episodes until we're at the 300th episode. You get all these shows early and ad-free over at adfreeshows.com. You can even be a part of our live studio audience. Uh, of uh, more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts. It starts at just nine bucks a month. That's like less than 20 cents an episode a month, daddy. And by the way, ad free shows is loaded with exclusive bonus and, and not just audio, but video content that you can't find anywhere else. We've got the book with David Crockett. We've got the insiders. We've got Monday mailbag with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick and a brand new series Tuesday with the taskmaster. Oh, how about the hacksaw hour? And as I understand it, there's another big one that we're about to announce. You get them all over at adfreeshows.com. Plus, in addition to that, you can attend our live recordings, and there's even live Q&A sessions and watch-alongs for all of our favorite hosts every month. So much bonus content, more than you can shake a stick at. It's adfreeshows.com. By the way, if your business targets men that are 25 to 54 years old, no better place to advertise than right here with us. You can do so at advertisewitheric.com. I also want to mention if you've got a question about our show, you can ask it right now on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. It's at 83 weeks. We've got some fun new swag and merch uh, that you can support at 83 weeksmerchcom We've got some stickers and some hats and some tank tops and some hoodies and some koozies and some Yeti cups and fun stuff. We've also got a, a pretty fun YouTube channel. I want you to check out. It's one thing to hear the show. It's another thing to see it. It's 83 weeks on youtube.com. And, uh, Eric, I never know what to expect when we sit down and click record, but watching what could have been the only televised Bret Hart Hulk Hogan singles match in history. And, uh, it happened almost 25 years ago today. How about that? It's pretty cool. And by the way, I saw that endeavor, uh, excuse me, the merchandise, uh, shot that you had up there. There's a shirt that says endeavor to persevere. I'm going to send one to Ari Emanuel and Vince McMahon. I like it. They should both be wearing one. (laughs) And uh, if you listen to last week's special bonus episode, hey, hey, it's Conrad uh, Thompson here business. to tell you There's a little a more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Here. Get early. Uh, we'll get free next week to more than right a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every, every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad-Free Shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like Title Chase, Eric Fires Back, Conversations with Conrad, and The Insiders, plus new series like The Book with David Crockett, Monday Mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick, and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early, you can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus, ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch-alongs, Q&As, and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now. See for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today. And hey, when you do, the first week is completely free. Adfreeshows.com. <laughs>